Welcome to the Bradenton City Council meeting, Wednesday, February 23rd, 2020 at City Hall Council Chambers, 8.30 a.m. This time we'd like to call Reverend Dr. Robert Baker, the rector from Christ Episcopal Church, to do our invocation. Please stand. Welcome. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, send down upon those who hold office in this city of Bradenton the spirit of wisdom, charity, and justice, that with steadfast purpose they may faithfully serve in their offices to promote the well-being of all people through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Please join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, we'll call the meeting to order. Mrs. Melton? Do you not have any proclamations or presentations today? Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, we'll go to citizen comment on non-agenda items. Uh, comments on, on the agenda items that are, if they're there, will be accepted at that time. First, we have Rodney Jones. Mr. Jones, please come forward, and you'll have, state your name and address, and you'll have three minutes. I'm Rodney Jones, 213 16th Avenue West. Uh, just want to continue to encourage uh, some equity and equality and justice within this chambers. Um, Mayor Brown, we're greatly disappointed in your ability to lead the city during a time of crisis. Uh, we've got allegations of misconduct. We've got allegations of perjury, and you have failed to respond to those in any manner whatsoever. Um, even to the point of ADA violations where you continue to deny me access to due process, I put it in writing, I've requested over and over again for you to email me and communicate with me and you have not, just as your predecessor has not. I have emailed the uh, commissioner of the police used to be in the, in the marriage since 2016 and have never ever gotten a response. I've requested meetings. Um, I've asked you to communicate with me by email because it's better for me. I can't, I'm blind, brother. You know, I'm not making this up. And so I ask you to email stuff to me because it helps me organize my material. So I do, I help a lot of people. So I organize that way. You've denied me everything. It's an absolute disgrace. It's disrespectful to me as a good citizen in the city of Bradenton. I was the city of Bradenton's best partner in the Bradenton Police Department, and they'll tell you that bar none in the history of Manatee County. You disgraced my family, my family name. And I highly encourage your attorney to call me today because I'm filing a complaint, and I've got Tawana Johnson here that worked with ADA to let you know the magnitude of the violations that you've done. You're going to cripple this city, and you've destroyed your political career, not by me, but by your own behavior and your own conduct, and your own racist demeanor toward black people. You're in trouble, my friend. You better find your way to God, and you better find it quick. Thank you. Uh, next on the comments, we have Tawanda, Tawana Johnson. Please state your name and address, and you'll have three minutes. Good morning. Good morning. Ron Johnson. Address is P.O. Box 155, Talavash, Florida. I'm here on behalf of Mr. Jones making an ADA complaint. My job is I do ADA um, transportation services, and that is a huge violation. As a public servant, as we all know, we take an oath to serve our people, no matter what, who they are or what they may be. But it, the oath is that we must serve everyone and serve everyone faithfully. And ADA violation is a huge violation. It also can cause the city dollar, millions of dollars for uh, reporting a fraud of not a violation or not providing the information that's requested. Whatever is available to any citizen has to be available to an ADA recipient. 
So you have to provide that information within reasonable time of a request being made. So if it was me, I would do what is right because I know our department has faced many of uh, ADA uh, complaints and had to do what was appropriate in order to resolve those issues. Thank you. All right, we have, um, I believe, Nicole Gavin. Please come forward. Please state your name and address, and you have three minutes for the record. Nicole Gavin, P.O. Ma'am, ma'am, can you get to the microphone so we can hear? Thank Nicole you. Gavin, P.O. Box 701, 17th Avenue West. Um, I'm just here to tell my story. Um, my name is Nicole Gavin. I lived at 1510 16th Street East for over 10 years. I'm a single parent of three and a grandmother. On September 3rd, 2020, a fire started in my house. A fire started in my back room due to a laptop plug in the wall. Fire departments was called immediately when the fire started, when the firefighters got there, they were not dressed, putting on clothes in the middle of the street, and they went to a nearby fire hydrant, um, cut on the fire hydrant, and no water came out, which someone recorded and sent it to me. They then had to call several trucks from different, depart different districts. By the time they did that, I watched my house burn completely, losing everything I owned besides the clothes on me and my kids' back. Red Cross put us in a hotel for a week or two. Since, I've been paying for hotels since. My landlord didn't even try to contact me. I, I, I wouldn't wish this on anyone. The sad thing is no one even tried to contact me. I say, I say this to, wait, to, oh Lord. I say the city of Brainerd is responsible for me losing everything. If the fire hydrant was working, they could have at least saved some stuff in my house. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Chief, can you do a little research, maybe get with her outside and find out some of the information? Thank you. Okay, we've got two more. Joseph Shaw. Please state your please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes, sir. Good morning. My name is Joseph Shaw. <clears throat> Mayor, I wrote you personally about the situation that occurred at 211 Avenue. Uh, uh, supposedly a robbery had took place at racetrack. Me and my neighbors and guests were in my yard. The police approach us for no apparent reason, draw guns. And, you know, it's, it's dark where I stay at. I couldn't, I probably wouldn't be here this morning talking to you guys if it weren't for my neighbors and my guests that was there. So, I know you employ these guys but they need a little bit of training on how to handle situations and what to do and what not to do. Because if I hadn't took my hands out of my pocket, who knows what would have happened. And I wasn't interfering with anybody's investigation, but to come to someone else's property and threaten them, what am I supposed to do? And I'm not saying that, you know, all police are wrong, but it needs to be checked from top to bottom. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Mayor, um, yes, ma'am. Right, and I did forward that on, and just like all emails I get, I forward them to the appropriate um, station for that. So, all right, thank you. Um, we have one more. It looks like Shavonda Griffin. Please come forward, and please state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes.
Mrs. Shavonna Griffin, 2812 6th Avenue Drive, East Palmetto. I've written to you guys. I know you guys got all my emails, but I've yet to receive a response back. About the issue and the problem that we've had over in Bradenton Housing Authority. You guys say that we don't show up for the meetings. We read the last one that was postponed. So we showed up in numbers, plan to keep showing up. But I want to ask the question this morning because, see, I said I'm a God advocate for God's people, and I am. God sent Moses to tell the Pharaoh to let his people go and let them go free before he parted the Red Sea. And what the Pharaoh failed to realize with his heart and heart was that God was going to set his people free anyway. He was giving him a chance to soften his heart and understand the problem that was at hand and what he should be doing in the right mannerism. <clears throat> Mr. Brown, you're the mayor. And I look to you because you're the shepherd of the city. Now, God didn't appoint you as a shepherd, but the people did. I don't know who your father is that you serve, but I know who I serve. And you have a duty. So we expect for you to do the duty that you've been served to do. And for you not to reply back to anything, to respond back to anything, and for you to feel as if though it's okay for these young ladies to be treated in the way that they have been and the things that have been happening by an employee, we hold you accountable because you hold their lives in your hand as well as anybody in the city of Bradenton because you're the shepherd. I came to tell you this morning that God is already watching and he's waiting to see just what's going to take place. I have a message that when you leave here today, expect a phone call. In that phone call, you might not like the news. Mr. Sanders, I know that you're laughing behind closed doors. You sit on the board and you're pretending to take an ear, but you're not really taking an ear. So you're gonna be held accountable and you will see the wrath first. So know that you've been warned. And as I say, God's people are at hand. So I suggest that the right thing be done for these people that are people and that because of the housing situation that they're living in or having to go through at this point in time because they look for a hand up does not make them criminals. So they shouldn't be treated as dogs on the street. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have another comment? Okay. All right. Um, Ellis Mitchell, Jr. Please come forward, state your name and address, and you'll have three minutes. Ellis Mitchell, Jr., 2002 9th Avenue East, Bradenton, Florida. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, City Council members. Uh, three minutes is not enough time for me to respond to some of the it comments. Just, this is the citizen comment, three minutes. Thank you. I'm going to provide a document for the City Council and the Mayor to read in he response to Ms. Giffens. Uh, a whole housing group. Have there is no 10 minute component in citizen comment. I, I, I'm yeah. providing a document in response. I'm going to give it to the clerk. You guys can read it. If you have any comments or questions about it, feel free to contact me if I've already reached out to you before. Thank you. Thank you. Any other citizen comment? I have no other cards. At this time, we'll move forward to consent agenda. I think um, Rob is trying to... Consent, Mr. Perry, did you have something before we go to consent agenda? Before we go to consent agenda, Mayor, um, I, I just think it's probably important to just put some comments into the record. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had the opportunity to review Ms. Griffin's emails, and uh, there was definitely serious allegations, and I appreciate yourself and Mr. Sanders asking me to review it. I spoke with the um, city attorney regarding the designation of, of the uh, housing and urban development and what our authority was over them and of course they're a federal agency I think there was a statement made about you have an employee you you were no, no city officials or, or the city administrator has employees at the federal housing 
and Urban Development Authority. There are serious grievances. Um, I, I looked at the photographs. I, I understand what Ms. Griffin was saying, and I think there's multiple folks involved. And so when I spoke with Mr. Rudisell, we, we, we took it very seriously. Mr. Rudisell had been involved with um, the prior um, administration at HUD and the like. And there's internal grievance procedures, basically, for these kinds of things through the Federal Housing and Urban Development Authority. Unfortunately, they're not at the dais of city council. Um, I believe that, that HUD is having their annual meeting where their board of directors will be there in early March. I would uh, urge Ms. Griffin to certainly bring her grievances to that meeting. Um, the extent of our participation in that is that we do appoint members to the Housing and Urban Development Board, which, which I think was dutifully uh, uh, appointed in this case and and in speaking with some of the counselors we believe we have people that are engaged that are accountable that are that are interested in the betterment of the housing authority both for the residents as well as the overall administration of it so I just wanted to be very clear that uh, the email did not fall on deaf ears that elected officials took what I believe to be appropriate action and are taking appropriate action and that really the gist of this if there is grievances between tenants and landlord management being Mr. Ellis who's the executive director that that needs to start really with the board that is the boss of Mr. Ellis and ultimately this federal in inspector generals and other uh, other offices that are are basically established to vet those types of complaints and, and that would be important to direct them to, uh, to us because as far as the law is, that's a federal facility. It's like a military base or an airport or, or otherwise. It's preempted. We, we don't have a lot of authority to go in there. If I walked in there as the city administrator, Mr. Ellis could say, get off my property, and it'd be completely within his powers and authority to do it. So I, I just think it's important, and I recognize that Ms. Griffin isn't concerned with the nuances of the of the legalities and, 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 and uh, authorities of this because she's just a resident helping other residents there and I really appreciate that um, for sure but but it has to go to the right people if we want to get some of these complaints resolved respectfully it's good that Miss uh, Griffin came down but we're probably not very powerful in regarding to be able to do things about it thank you mr. Yep. Perry mr. Sanders I agree with everything you said mr. Perry and uh, mr. Ellis he and I have uh, talked for a year and a half now since I've been there, and I understand his situation very much, and he goes over these complaints at every board meeting. And I think the, the public uh, is invited always, uh, to my knowledge, and that any grievances should be addressed by the board, which actually supervises uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell so that if there's something that's inaccurate they can correct the record and then they can act upon it uh, obviously City Council is not the place to do it but we I sit there at every meeting and I monitor and um, I, um, so that's all I'll say at this point because I think I think the citizens I agree, I'm not taking sides uh, but because I, I know there's always two sides to everything uh, and I've heard, you know, I've, I read the comments and so forth, but I haven't heard the other side at any meeting that I've been to in the last year and a half. So I, I'm, I would invite you, and I think Mr. Ellis would, would agree that he would invite you to uh, uh, pr present to the board if you have a particular issue with him as the executive director. Thank you. And, and as um, I said, the emails do never uh, or don't ever go unanswered. They are forwarded to the appropriate departments. Um, gentleman came up today about something that happened and it's been a pro sent to the police department. Sometimes I think it's a process that you have to let go through first to let the proper procedure go through so we don't taint the situation. So, you know, when things come up, every email that's been sent to me has either been forwarded or answered by me. And if it's been forwarded to the appropriate department, they have answered the questions. So, and there's, that's been happened a lot. And you'll see when it's the appropriate time, um, whether it's by email or by phone, if I receive a phone message from somebody that sent me an email, I, sent, I called them and left a message and have not heard back. So, you know, I'm trying to communicate in the best way as well as letting some of the processes go through um, with the Braden Housing Authority. I believe this board through my office has appointed a couple of new members to that board in the last year that have hopefully started helping to hold accountable if there is things to be accountable 
you know, and, and again, let that process go through. This has been something in my 10 years up here, and I think other council members that have been here, there's things that sometimes you'd like to try to help out with, but it's not in our jurisdiction. So unfortunately, we can only do what we do. And I believe over the last year, as Mr. Sanders has said in the past, we have gotten some board members on there that now are maybe going to hold things accountable, but also to hold the citizens accountable. It's got to be a two-way street through the Braden Housing Authority both ways. If there's a problem, they fix it. If there's abuse, it needs to be fixed. So that's something that we all do. So thank you, Mr. Perry, for those comments, Mr. Sanders. Um, ma'am, ma'am, this is, ma'am, ma'am, they're out of order. This is a, a business meeting. So um, the chair will entertain a motion for consent agenda. And hold the office, supersedes. Please, sir, please, sir. Sir, sir, you're out of order. You're out of order. Consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can yep. I, I'd like to pull, um, I, I approve the consent, consent agenda, less item B. I sure. just want some clarification. Okay, perfect. So we have a motion to approve consent agenda A, C, and D. Is there a second? Second. second. All right. Heard Mr. Sanders first. All right. Any further comment on that? All right. Um, start the voting in Ward 4. Yes. 5. Yes. One. Yes. Two. Yes. Three. Yes. Yes, sir. Pass unanimously, Mr. Roth. Okay. Um, so item B is the joint meeting with Manti County Commission. I just wanted to get some clarification before we approve it. That. Um, yes, sir. Uh, so, first off, uh, I, I want to make sure. That, so we're going to have an agenda. I'd mm -hmm. like to have an agenda on yes. this that we're going to stick to. Yes. Um, you know, I just want to make sure that when we go in there, that everyone understands that. Uh, we are an equal government mm -hmm. that basically we we charge our citizens taxes and we provide services and in my opinion we provide superior services um the rest of the county and, and we also pay county taxes Correct. Uh, our county taxes are just about equal to our city taxes we have our own reservoir we have our own water treatment plants we have our own sewage plants we have our own solid waste we have our own fire we have our own police um you know we basically provide everything that the uh, county charges everyone else for, and we pay equal. So we're we're pretty much premium taxpayers for the county because the city the city takes care of the of, of, of all the needs. So I just want to make sure that when we're going in there, that um, you know all I know of the county is what I've seen and read in the papers. So I just want to make sure that that we understand going in that we are an equal. Mm -hmm. government I want the meeting to be set up as such and I want agendas yes it definitely will be and it the layout will be like you said we'll, there, they, we won't be in their uh, chamber we'll be up in the manatee room where it'll be everybody will be equal set up you know obviously the mayor and chair will be mm -hmm. leading it and everybody else will be together I um, mean if you look here it's if you read the explanation it basically says uh, <coughs> City Council for the city of Braden to participate in a joint meeting with Manatee mm -hmm. County Commission to discuss and plan matters of mutual interest okay. so it's going to be what we do the county owns a lot of property in our city and I'd like to know what their plans are before I see it okay. in the paper okay. you know some so those will be the questions that we have and what's of mutual interest to make our city grow which I think plays into some of our CIP plan and there's you know as we know streets and roads right. throughout our city are right. FDOT right. and county so I want to know what their plans are sometimes before and how okay. again publicly where no one gets accused of backroom right. deals right. because there is no backroom deals going on here okay, so. okay. I, like yeah, i said i perfect. just wanted to yep. make sure that we're uh, my understanding of what i'm going into yeah. is so good nope that's perfect so I think thank you for this question because that's important so question mr sanders i, I, I agree with mr roth uh, wholeheartedly and i would like to see an agenda uh, well in advance of this March 24th I thought we was going to agree on that date but that's that date is fine with me it's far enough out that I didn't have anything scheduled uh, but um, I'd like to have uh, an agenda from a full agenda and not ad, 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 uh, ad hoc when we go in there mm -hmm. to, to get away from uh, specific items and um, <clears throat> I, I, again with Mr. Roth is, is correct I, I read a lot of things in the paper that may or may not be true and people can say anything I understand that and sometimes in a political year that's done frequently but I don't like to read in the paper that <clears throat> uh, the county government or any other government is telling the city 
uh, what to do with their land or, or, or vice versa. I don't make comments for the county what they should do. If I do, I do it privately with the, the commissioners and, and ask if they would look into it. But I don't make the front pages of paper that they're going to uh, do certain things and that has happened, which concerns me and I think this uh, council needs to have a policy that, that sets out <coughs> uh, that we, uh, uh, we get presented with these ideas from county government or any other government uh, at the council meeting prior to it being a public uh, uh, forum in a newspaper or uh, somebody coming up to me and saying, uh, do you agree with this? As if I didn't even know it was county was doing it. So it looked like they took authority away from us. And I know at one of the first council of government meetings about a year ago, <coughs> uh, one of the commissioners asked for uh, charter government. And for those of you who may not know what charter government is, but basically charter government takes away the authority of this city. And uh, Mr. Callahan was there as administrator. He, he, he spoke against it, and everybody spoke against it, and it became uh, quashed only because of, of multiple municipalities had uh, voiced their opinion. And uh, so, but that has came up again uh, in another uh, meeting. Or, and so uh, I... It, I, I'd hope that that wouldn't be on the agenda because that's something seriously, seriously that would be controversial. And uh, so again, I want to see these items, items that we want. It seems here's the problem I see is that, uh, that this is being directed by the county, not so much by the city. I think they uh, have more wants from us than we do from them. Um, they have all the money, and we seem to have, but we have the. Like I said, the, the, the diamond in the rough that needs some polishing, and they they want to they want to have recognition for that. And I, I'm a, I'm a little uh, burly when it comes to uh, allowing that to happen. And I'm hoping that my my board and mayor support uh, the city. Otherwise, uh, we can hand it over to the government and have one of everything. You know, uh, county county manager. I mean, that's done. I've seen it in other. Communities where they have a county manager, the, the, the basically the city um, is, is is nothing more than figureheads, and they have they lose control. They have one fire department, one police department, one of everything. So it does. There is a cost effectiveness to it. Sometimes it gets out of hand once it's it's what's it's developed. What I've seen and witnessed in the past. So I don't want uh, uh, a conversation on abolishing city government uh, for the benefit of, of county and that's like i said been mentioned multiple times and i'd hope that we would refrain from uh, uh, entertaining that at this meeting thank you mr sanders and mr roth and um the it has not been driven by the county it's been driven by me oh, i'm sorry well i just wanted to comment to that but um it's been driven more by me talking with the chairman at this time to come together and more about our needs and that's one of the things. I don't know where you're hearing other things from, unless it's just propaganda out there, but it's not. I mean, I haven't, I haven't heard that they want to bring up charter government again. That's not on any agenda that we've talked about. It was, it was a, been in the record of the Council of Governments. That we want to do charter government? But that, that was a year ago. We to do the charter government, yeah. and it, it became as like a firestorm for 10 minutes of everybody saying, no, you're not taking over my government. Everybody, including me, and then I was, I led it at the end, and, and I sat right next to the county commissioner that said it, and, and basically said, you know, it's not something that will happen under my watch. And this council all stood up, as well as other mayors and county commissioners. So I haven't heard that come back since that meeting, which was about a year ago. Um, and I haven't heard that at all. So that's not even on our agenda is more about what we can do to improve downtown and work together. And that agenda will come out. But we had to we had to set a meeting with the resolution the way things are done. The county has their protocol. They have to do Mr. Rudisell. Then we have our protocol. It's not that we just can't say let's have a meeting. Mm -hmm. This is a meeting about us and how we improve our city and go forward. So those are the things that that obviously, you know, I'm looking for as, as the mayor and with this council coming up and having our voice heard, which I don't think a lot of times it does um, when we're just out there one-offs. Mrs. Coker? Yeah, um, I, I'm kind of glad I, I, I had not really thought 
about some of these things, but I really have been looking at this and any discussions I've had with the chair of the count of the county commission. I feel like it's just more to facilitate a better relationship because there are often times that we're that we're working and we could be more efficient if we work together. I, I mean, I think it's good for us to be cautious. I, I have not heard a word about the charter government again, and I hope that doesn't come up because I completely agree with you about that. But I think that there are definitely ways that we can improve. I mean, we all stood there and looked at the transportation planning and how some of that stuff was stopping right at the border. And so maybe we could call that to attention more. And I just think let's go in with good intentions. I mean, like you said, we're our own government, and I don't think we're going to get steamrolled into anything. So I think this is only could go, I think us working together and having a good relationship with all the other governments can only improve things. I hope I'm right, but, you know, I appreciate y'all's comments. <laughs> oh, anyone else? I mean, yeah. oh, well, Mr. Sanders had it first. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. I would like to have a, a, an agenda and a date that's at least a week out from the March 24th. I'd like to have an agenda that's, that's finalized by the 17th so that there's no surprises at this. Uh, right. I agree. At this meeting, so because I don't want to be discussing things that are non-agended. Um, Thank you very much, because that's so. that was my goal in it, having okay. the agenda. We want to, and again, when Chairman Van Ostenbridge and I talked about doing it with our city administrator and our county administrator, Dr. Hopes, is that we wanted to come up with some key items to try to start the discussions that would hopefully be a win-win for our city and the county, but the county is our city too. Right. And a win-win without a lot of uh, a debate. You know, I mean, we want to kind of listen. It's that first meeting. You always want to have your first meeting, kind of listen, hear how things are going, and then move on from there. Mr. Perry, it looks like you had something, or did no, you? No, sir. Okay. I thought you were sitting up in there. But um, so I agree with you, Mr. Sanders, on that. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure the county will facilitate the agenda from the standpoint of getting it to us, but they will not facilitate all that's on it. We will. Who would chair the uh, uh, meeting? Mr. Van, Chairman Van Osterbridge and myself. So to be the way it's going to be, the way I envision it's going to be set up, Mr. Perry, you can. We we asked for it in the Manatee Room. We didn't ask for it on their dais because nobody everybody can sit. But that room, if you've ever been up there, I think it's like a U-shaped tables. So you know, the front of the U-shape would be where the mayor and the chairman are, and then down the sides. I don't know. I mean, I can ask them, but do you want all of us sitting on one side and all of them on one side, or do we want to mix it up? It doesn't matter. I mean, I think the point's going to be the same. We're going to talk and go through the agenda, bring up some things, and then nothing will be voted on, obviously. We'll talk about things, and then each individual board will have to take it back. And will this be a vote. daytime meeting, evening meeting? It says in the, 130, 130 on the 24th. Is, it was in the agenda, yeah. Okay, yep. 130. Yeah. And the public's invited? The public's invited, and it will so be on if, TV. What if that room is not conducive to a lot of people, maybe 10, 15 people I've been in there. And yeah, I think they have other means of so they streaming the meeting to other rooms and streaming. Oh, yeah. and not yeah. as a council is the. Yeah. Uh, I know they've had big meet. They've had big housing authority meetings in there. Yeah. One time I had to sit down in their chamber and watch it oh, because right. it was full. Yeah. So their 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 chambers is is scheduled for that day versus having it there. I don't know how you'd do it with. Right. No, I think I don't. They, they don't have any other meetings because they are the meetings. County right. commissioners. There's no other. From what I understand, but I'll confirm that. But they have the means, and it will be on TV. You know, the METV will be there doing it. So, yep, it's all normal, sunshine meeting. Good that way. So, thank you for the comments. Yes, Mr. Roth. Yeah, I just wanted to, because so, the conversation brought, and it's, it's a good conversation. It just basically, because we're approving it, so I'd like to know what we're approving. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that when this started, um, <coughs> uh, I know Councilwoman Barnby and I were, were on the board when uh, she was here before, just before me, when this is the after, the, the, the council governments came up the aftermath of the first county attempt to have charter government. And this is what we decided was going to happen. I think it was decided prior to me. But, um, and then, uh, and in concept, it was a great setup because what was meeting at that time uh, when I came on board was just the uh, municipalities and the county. That was it. And I thought that they were quite effective. And the next thing you know, the school board came in. And then um, one of the commissioners decided to go after the fire districts. And then all of a sudden, they were all in. We had seven fire districts at the time. 
and then you know the, the airport authority, the colleges, and it just it just got so weighted down that I thought that we walked away from the mission was to for for municipalities, government, and the counties to interact same type of business. I mean, a school board is a government, but they have a different mission statement than we do. We you know so. And we're, 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 we have similar governments that do similar similar services. That's so. That's all. I, I, I think that the county, the, the commission, the, the council governments walked away from this. So we're moving back towards it. I think it could be effective. I just wanted to make sure mm -hmm. that all things are equal. I'm, I'm a big defender of home rule, including cities and counties. Mrs. Barnaby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a little different recollection of it. Uh, as far as how the Council on Governments got started, it came out of the accord, yeah. which came out after the annexation of part of Perico Island and the Arvida proposed development on Perico, and that is when they started talking about charter government and so forth and so on. And Cliff Walters was very intimately involved in putting together individuals to work on the accord and part of the agreement with the accord was to start having council of government meetings but that's my recollection thank you and that's one of the I just want to make a comment mr. Sanders and I'll come to you um, that's one of the reasons that I thought it was great because when I got here in 2013 the council of governments was going but there was really nothing on the agenda as you would go and even there was a lot of city officials from all cities and that weren't going so it kind of started to die out there wasn't a lot of agenda items so if you remember back last year we asked them to start letting the individual cities chair a meeting instead of just the county always running it because that's the whole purpose of that they were always just setting the agenda doing that now through pushing by some of us that we were able to start where we rotate the chairs now of each meeting. We set the agendas of those meetings, and that was a good olive branch, I think, by all of us to reach out and say do it. But like um, has been said here, you've got other government entities now on it that, yeah, I like to hear things about the school board at times. I like to hear about the fire districts and all, but if we're having an, a situation between City of Bradenton and Manatee County, we'd like to meet with them, talk about it, and come up with some efficiencies. Obviously, we know there's different ways to do our fire uh, suppression, our, our police, our garbage, or whatever we're talking about. If we can hear some things from them, not to take us over, but to hear and come back together, it may streamline services, may also save some of our citizens money, you know, because we're able to now work together. We know, as uh, Mr. Perry says often, the jigsaw puzzle that we live in here you know is hard and sometimes you could be in a corner that the city is three parts around you but the county is on you so we've got to try to figure out how we can streamline some of these services as mr. McCollum knows you know there's a lot of places that have city but they're county water so how do we figure that out how do we work together in some of that you know so services are important but it is not about charter government I'll say that point blank if I hear that I will not be for bringing that up. And now again, I appreciate your comments, Mr. Sanders. Let's have an agenda and we will stick to the agenda and, you know, not really have 13 people decide they want to go off on a tangent somewhere individually because then it defeats the purpose of that meeting. You know, so I appreciate that. All right, uh, Mr. Sanders, did you have something? <clears throat> Yeah, the Council of Governments was, Mr. Barnaby is, is correct, it was because of the dispute over the annexation at Preco, and it was very contentious, and that's how the, the Council of Governments was actually formed, and then there was a cord between the county and, and the city on that that lasted until, um, until I was elected. I went out to the Council of Governments meeting and uh, Miss Whitmore was the chair at the time and she was very surprised to see anyone from the city of Bradenton. And so I asked her later why, she said, well, nobody's ever been coming. I said, well, here, here's, the, here's the reason, because they don't feel they have a voice. Mm -hmm. It's ran by the county, the agenda is set by the county. <clears throat> we don't discuss anything that we can do jointly. We can't prove anything we can do jointly, so it's kind of a waste of time. And that's why nobody shows up. And that's what the council told me in, in the first meetings of, of my tenure here. So 
I, I said, look, we either, we either come together and uh, discuss things that everybody has to do, like uh, transportation. Transportation involves all of us. I tried to set up a committee. I failed. I wasn't able to get that. But we did uh, abolish the accord because everything had been satisfied on it. So we abolished the accord in 2019, so that, that no longer exists. And I do like the rotation of the chairs. We do that with the MPO, with the counties. We got two counties, Braden and Sarasota, and then we got several cities. So we do rotate that between cities and counties and back and forth. So it does because the agenda is sometimes set by uh, the, the chairman and the uh, MPO uh, director. And, it, it, and that's, that's happened at the Council of Government. So we have changing, and I noticed that now we're getting a lot of participation. And to me, the Council of Government should be of the government to have money to spend on roads, infrastructure, or something we can cooperate on. You know, not, not just uh, <coughs> pet projects that, that they like to see, but building buildings and that type of stuff. You know, for example, the county uh, controls uh, 27th Street. They control 43rd Street. They control 26th Street, right in the heart of our city. That we have a hard time cooperating with them and getting things done and uh, so we need to have commitments from them that they will help us with these uh, because of our crazy boundaries that we've got that the zigzags that who owns what and, and and it even causes a problem with the fire department and police department I've heard it numerous times is who's got to go Oh, it's your turn. I don't know. It, 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 it's, it's, it's that those things need to be probably uh, issues that I'd like to speak about, not who's going to build a building on a waterfront property or that type of thing. So, and I know Mr. McClellan has a big problem with that. Where do we, where do we, do, where, where do we go? Um, I see Mr. Gallo. He used to bring up the the, the, the park out there that the county was doing things that we had no authority over. And, and, and so we would have to go to them. But those are the types of things we need to be doing jointly that affects both of us versus uh, development or anything like that. So I'd, I'd rather see it geared to, you know, how, how the city and the county can work together to function, especially with traffic issues. And if you want a, a pre-trial or a pre-run, Holmes Beach on March 1st has a meeting between them and the county uh, on March 1st if you'd like to attend or I, I, I intend on t attending to see how that goes because they have a list already out there of, of wants and needs on the on their in their uh, uh, city government and so we might see how that that goes if you want to attend that thank you and, and like I said I totally agree with the way we're setting this up in um, 2013 I got on this council and I attended the majority, if not uh, all that they had of the Council of Government meetings. And it was, uh, like, you know, I had the same concerns as most people there. They were, most of them were getting canceled because they didn't have any agenda items and nobody was sending anything because the outside the county didn't feel like things were engaged. And now with the way things have gone over the last couple of years, um, we are engaged because we are helping chair and go through that. So that was something that, that I, I do know that that I had attended most of them that they had because you know all of a sudden at noon on a day that we were gonna have the meeting they cancel it so, and I don't think before we started having them consistent again I think three of the four or more were canceled because there was no agenda items so but yep I mean everybody remember Patrick you remember getting those emails that they yep, were canceled absolutely. So, yep so all right thank you mrs. coachman thank you thank you mr. mayor um, I appreciate the history uh, of how things have evolved into being equitable. So I find it um, encouraging that the municipalities and the county are going to work more in tandem and as opposed to one entity trying to take over the other or monopolize. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Mr. Roth. Um, uh, move to approve item B, resolution 2210, joint meeting with Mantee County Commission. Second. Do we have a time? Yes, yes. it's 1:30. The 24th at 1:30. 1:30. Uh, and and, and uh, discussion that, that, that we have uh, uh, agenda seven days prior, we will. and uh, added to this that's not in that resolution. But I want to make sure that that's that when we're voting, we're voting on that that uh, uh, 
Mr. agenda set before the meeting so that we can I don't know how you do that but it, well, I don't think that was part of the motion um, if and it, we will well I would It'll amend the motion to, to add a, a time certain for the agenda then uh, seven days prior it's, to the meeting yeah. it, you, I have to get permission I understand the rules uh, would you allow that that time certain for um, the agenda I amend the motion to approve uh, um, uh, to have the agenda seven days prior sure. that's fine with sure. it, it doesn't it's matter we we'll have 24th. the agenda long before that so. okay yep so in the seconder is okay with that Ms. Second. Coachman yep. all right so let that reflect in the resolution okay all right start the vote in ward five yes one yes two yes three yeah four yes thank you carries five to zero all right next business advertising petition hearings and communications anything on that Nothing? no sir i'm okay. sorry all right no problem all right new to business by department heads we have our cra thank you good morning mayor city council mr perry um, my name is Katerina Jeraikio Siren, and I'm the CRA Executive Director, and I'm here in, uh, in front of you to, as part one of uh, hopefully approvals, uh, to move forward with a land use restriction agreement between the city, the CRA, and HTG Riverview 6 uh, Limited. Um, Riverview 6 will be a five-story, 80-unit new construction, a multifamily uh, development that will be located in downtown Bradenton in the Bradenton CRA. And it will be leased for wor to working individuals and families. It's not gonna be age-restricted. Age and the individuals and families will be earning, it's gonna be truly affordable, and they'll be earning 30, 60, and up to 70% of the area medium income. Um, just to give you a little bit under, uh, understanding what that means, um, if we're looking at the 2021 income limits that have been set by the federal government for this year, the, me the median income in Manatee County right now is 77,200. And if we look at 50%, of that uh, for one person uh, making $27,050, two people would be making up to $30,900, and for a three-person household, up to $34,750. And that's at the 50%. So some of the renters would be making income even less than that, and some of them would be making a little bit more than that. Um, it will be, the, the development is proposed to be consisting of one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units. And um, before you, you have a proposed land use restriction agreement. I will go over some of the key items uh, for your consideration. And Mr. Rodasel, if I miss omit anything, please uh, help me add it. Um, from the city's commitment, uh, the developer is coming forward to ask for a waiver of the impact fees that uh, the city would charge them. And we have estimated those fees. To be approximately 200, uh, seven, uh, approximately 277,000, and that includes for parks, police, fire, roads, water, and sewer. The developer would still be responsible for all the other fees, such as the school board or the Mosquito District. And they're also asking that the gap between for them to be able to make the development and all the tax credits they're getting and loans is 800,000. So the ask from the CRA is to pay the remainder between the 800,000 and the impact fees uh, that the city would commit to waive on their behalf. The other, committee, the other commitment from the city would be that if something happens to the CRA in the next couple of years until that development um, is completed, if the CRA ceases to exist, then the city will take on that responsibility of approximately $550,000. 
Um, so from the CRA perspective, as, as I mentioned, it will be in the form of a loan uh, estimated to be around 550000 And we have a few clawbacks. So the construction has to begin before a first payment is made by the end of this fiscal year. The developer believes they're going to be starting by June. And when we talk about commencement of construction, it means pouring of the foundation. And also, once they achieve 90% of completion of the project, which has to happen, and occupancy has to happen before March 31st, 2024, otherwise the CRA and the city would take back whatever we've committed <coughs> to the project. Um, they're going to be work, uh, required to submit an annual report to both the city and the CRA. Uh, the term of this agreement is for 15 years following the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the project. And, um, and the reason for this request, and the developer is here, uh, Ms. Delia Tabora, who's the Assistant Vice President of Development, is because between COVID, construction costs have gone up, labor shortages, uh, and increase of labor, Additionally, they've had to purchase property that due to the prices now in our area, it has skyrocketed. So it's, it's put a financial burden to this project and that's why they're coming before the city and the CRA to ask for this amount of money. Um, so uh, Ms. Delia, if you'd like, she has a quick presentation to give you and we're both here for questions. Regarding this, could I ask you a couple of questions? Okay, thank you, Mrs. Mr. Sanders. You have a question? Yeah, uh, the um, occupancy March 21 and 24, uh, that is when the 15 years starts on the uh, agreement for uh, affordable housing. In other words, there's no, it starts then, not today. Um, I believe it's so the certificate of years. occupancy is when we start, not from now. March of 39, they're obligated to, to keep this as affordable housing rent for 15 years from March 20 March of 24 it will be affordable housing and if some of the units go to the 80 percent which is still considered workforce housing and they have tax credit that extend past the 15 years but for the purposes of this agreement we said 15 right. year it's going to be any combination between affordable and workforce okay, housing we have a copy of, I don't think it's in the packet if it is I'm sorry uh, of, of the um, uh, impact fees that we're going to waive sure. and uh, also the HUD um, uh, the guidelines guidelines of HUD because that changes annually it does will that change uh, will, will that will that it, will, does that does that commitment today or is that commitment on uh, 2024 it would be on whatever that annual whatever that is on 2024 however HUD adjusts the yearly then it would be the 30 percent of that income it could go up it, it could, could go, go down, up, go down probably go stay up. the same yeah, whatever it is, is. The, this is the HUD schedule that we, we all refer to as the affordable housing schedule based on income requirements that is correct uh, one uh, <clears throat> this project will not be uh, granted ad valorem uh, forgiveness of ad valorem tax they no. will pay ad valorem tax on the value of the it will property. not be so you're correct and, and if uh, thank you for pointing that out so as soon as this is built it will generate ta taxes that will go back to the city and the city and the county so over time we will recoup the money that we are committing right and, and the impact fees of 277,000 will come off of the $800,000 and so we'll be obligated. W when is the 550000 to be paid? Um, the proposal is to be broken in two portions. The first, uh, uh, it will be 150000 this fiscal year and it would be from the Bradenton CRA um, as long as they begin the construction before the end of the fiscal year and then the remainder will be next fiscal year. 2023. The, uh, 2020 the approximately approximate. these are estimated but uh, we've double check with two p so it's going to be around in that arena bet I would guess maybe between 250 so and 300 400 to 800 which we already no, approved I'm sorry it would be from about 275 to the 800 oh 275 to the 800 okay that is broken down in the two payments, 150 and then the remainder. Right, sorry, thank you. 
Any other questions before we go to our representative from HDG? All right, thank you. Thank you. Ma'am? Good morning again. Thank you for having me um, and good to see you all. Um, I She did a great job kind of explaining the technicalities of it, so I'm really here to kind of um, give you an update now that we are approximately three to four months from when we expect to begin construction. Um, again, my name is Delia. I, I'm the developer with Housing Trust Group. Uh, on your screen, you'll see um, a couple of the developments that we have uh, built here in Bradenton and Manatee County. Actually, um, the one in, in the county, Oaks at Lakeside, we didn't have a chance last year to do a grand opening, so that's actually gonna happen right now on March 17th, and we're really excited about <coughs> you know that new property. They, they both um, look great, are holding up great. Um, we are um, long-term managers also of all of our properties, so um, that's just something else to keep in mind. If you can go to the next slide, please. So um, I have been talking to the CRA about this um, site pretty much since we found it. Uh, it's a pretty well located, just a block south of Manatee Avenue and about two blocks east of here. Um, so it's, it's very central, uh, which has gotten um, you know, interest from the city, from staff, about really what we can bring there and uh, what they wanna see there. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is some renderings that we have of what uh, that corner of 6th Avenue and 9th Street West will be. Uh, part of this um, very important corner and what the city wanted to see again was some commercial space in there, which is not very typical for us to include with um, the affordable housing developments be because of the funding. Uh, but we've worked uh, with the city about where to kind of place it and we've arrived at about um, almost 4,000 square feet of retail space on that corner to kind of maintain it activated and maintain it as a commercial corridor. Um, so that's what's going on that street. Um, next slide, please. Yep, so that's just some options of uh, we're starting we're starting to do the, the leasing up and like marketing for that space. So hopefully we get some interest from some small businesses that can benefit from that and, and take that space down there. Um, this is another rendering. This is the view or the look from um, 6th Avenue. Um, and next slide if you can. Yep, this is just another one of, of the view from again 6th Avenue. So it's, um, as Katarina said, a five-story concrete building. Um, the ground floor going from left on your screen to right, it's basically um, on the right-hand corner, um, a children's playground for the residents, um, as well as all of the residential um, amenity spaces. So the clubhouse and the fitness center are all on the ground floor. Again, to make sure that we were activating that ground floor and um, kind of abiding with what the city wanted to see there. Um, and then all the way to the other corner, um, reaching that commercial space to the right-hand corner of that um, block. Uh, next one, please. Uh, this is also something else that we have been discussing and we're pretty excited about that we uh, hopefully are able to bring uh, through this location and this project. I know that the CRA has been very active in trying to um, you know, make more urban and arts programs that incorporate some public art. And so we uh, want to make sure that um, through that kind of element in the playground in that, in that corner that we can bring something interesting and something that will um, make this block and this new facade a little bit livelier. Um, so that's something else that we have been discussing. And yeah, the last slide is, is more uh, technical things, a little bit of what she was talking about. So what this request more or less encompasses is the impact fee waiver to be complemented with um, like a CRA uh, grant initially that is now being considered as a long-term loan. Um, we had been speaking of the of the grant from from the beginning and then we kind of spoke about the impact fee waivers and how those two could kind of complement each other 
so that the request could be a little bit less. Um, as Katerina explained, we would still be taking care of school impact fees. There's also um, building permit fees and utility connection fees that we also are paying. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's some other costs. So basically the remainder of that money, that's not the impact fee, that's the impact fees that are waived. Um, like I said, would go basically to cover that, the commercial space, the actual hard costs of that, which are not covered by any of the funding that we obtained from the state, as well as some of those other costs and fees and <coughs> the very, very steep increase in construction costs that we have seen since this deal was submitted. So if you follow the timeline, we applied to Florida Housing, the state agency in 2020. So all of the deals that were kind of submitted in there were using assumptions and underwriting assumptions from that time. And then, you know, as you know, 2020, 2021 came and things have been going in a kind of roller coaster that's a little bit scary for us in the construction industry. Um, we are expecting um, probably about 10 to 15% increase in those construction costs at a minimum. And so, yeah, this funding would really help bring all those elements that we're trying to keep um, in there. We also did not um, have any kind of um, uh, requests from the city in terms of land or ad valorem taxes, which are some of the other ways that you guys um, usually help projects like these. Um, the taxes usually helps in the operating site. Fortunately, this project can kind of um, sustain its own operations on a yearly basis. So really where the help would be most beneficial is in the construction period in this case, which is why we kind of went this route. Um, uh, yeah, other than that, um, I think she also mentioned it, but the, the, land, the land assemblage was, it was pretty tough to kind of get everyone on the same page. Um, we initially didn't have site control of the entire block, but we got that and that was pretty much like a $450,000 bust to get everyone happy and, and on board. Um, we are, like I said, about three to four months away from uh, financial closing, which is when we begin construction. Um, and this request is basically to authorize the CRA to execute the, the LURA and as well as any other documents relating to this in that future date. So at the financial closing, which is expected late April to early May. And, um, and, and yeah, so this is kind of like an advanced authorization for that. And this is um, again, part one of, I guess, two approvals that this would have to go through and yeah, if you guys have any questions for me, happy yeah, to answer. I, I do have one that I want to ask. You made a statement that you're not getting any school impact fee credits. Why is that? Because I know that there's ways to do that in well, the projects, I, I guess I mean affordable. Right. I, so I was actually talking to Katerina about that. I guess I mean through this approval that you guys are not, um, I guess, authorizing that. Yeah, right. Right. But, right. But there is means that other... I have reached out. I'm not sure if there's a, a complete waiver or just a reduction, but I have reached out to Manatee County, um, yeah, public schools. Yeah, and then my other question is, how often, and this is something I haven't seen on others, but I've seen other um, apartment complexes, and especially in this community, as soon as they're built, they resell. Do you resell them? No, no. Like I said, we, we own our assets pretty much long term, um, which is does differentiate us from some of the competitors even at the year 15 when there's sometimes some re like reshuffling of the of the debt and things we usually tend to just keep them as long-term assets so we have in our portfolio currently more than like 30 properties around florida that we own uh, we also manage them yeah because yeah, you've seen some of our apartment complexes again they're different styles but but are selling for at least two to three times more than what they just finished a year ago for, which obviously brings a lot of money into our CRA when something builds for 20 and sells for 76. Yeah. And those properties are all in the CRA, so that's going to be something that will benefit the CRA in the next tax cycle. So any questions, Mrs. Coker? Yeah, uh, two questions, and I may have missed this. Um, is this going to be stick-built or concrete block? Concrete, yeah. Okay. 
And um, are, how will you, we've seen, of course, you know, the increase in the costs to construct. We're seeing that and hearing that a lot. Are, is there anything you're going to do on your side to make sure that the, the additional help to cover those expenses is going to be enough to do it? So, I mean, are you going to have a, arrangements with the supplies now rather than when you're actually going to need them? I, I mean, do you have a way to make sure that we're not going to be hearing in a year, oh, prices have gone up even more, we need more help? Because we have seen that. And I think certain builders have a way of compensating for that or arranging so that they buy it now. I don't know how it is, but I, I mean, can you address that at all? Sure, yeah. And actually, to uh, just to give you a little bit more color on, on even the concrete construction, so in terms of the state and Florida housing, you have to tell them whether you're building stick or concrete. Uh, we applied as concrete. Uh, there is an option, and we're looking into it because I'm not even sure if that's going to be more um, cost um, beneficial for us, but there's um, a type of hybrid construction where you basically do your entire ground floor and your whole shell of the building in concrete and then um, the floors in, in between. So floors after the second floor are actually trusts. Uh, we're looking into that as a potential option, but even that's, uh, we're not sure that back, back two years ago, that for sure would have saved us a little bit, but now it might just be um, all concrete. So that's just a side note on, on that question that you had. And on the other end, on the second question, we fortunately go on our general contractors. Uh, our contract with them is always guaranteed maximum price. So we're going to go bidding for this project in about a month, a month and a half. Once we get back those bids and sign that contract, there is no price escalation allowed in those contracts. That's very important. I, I think almost all affordable housing developers have to do it that way to actually avoid the problem that, you, that you're kind of saying, because we really can't take any changes to our budget and our numbers once we close. Um, yeah. Okay. Mrs. Barnaby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for being here today. I see that the development's going to consist of one, two, and three bedroom units. Can you give us a little further breakdown as to what that mix is going to be? Yeah, so off the top of my head, I believe it's 16, 48, 16. So 16 one beds, 48 two bed, beds, and 16 three beds. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have square footage? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can I just ask the square footage sure. on this? Um, it's about 600 square feet for the one beds, uh, about 850 square feet for the two beds, and 1,050 to 1,100 for the three beds. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Mr. Sanders. Yep. Uh, excellent project. You've, you're, I'm an advocate for your group every time. Um, th this is exactly what we sh should be doing and doing more of. Uh, you've come in here with a small a ask from us. Uh, the smallest ask I've seen in four years, except for your other project that you just completed. I mean, the last time we had a what was allegedly a, a affordable housing, our CRA had to fund it for three million dollars. And I'm opposed to those uh, types of, of government money uh, for apartments. Uh, if you want to bring 100 jobs into our city, I'll be glad to entertain it, but not just for apartments. So I, I appreciate what you've done. I know there's tax credits you get that others cannot get in market rate <coughs> um, development. But this is a beautiful building. The ask is almost nominal to begin with. Uh, keep building. Keep coming back. Keep buying more. Ask us to help you. Um, the I met with the school board last week or week before about this, and you need. To, you said you've already talked to them, but please uh, insist on uh, school board waiver of those fees. They're very hot on this right now, and I don't know if it's been before their board, but they had a special meeting that I was at and spoke in favor of. And I believe if, if, if you're not qualified, nobody is. <laughs> so that's, that's an, a lot of money. Uh, and, and I think that um, <clears throat> you can tell them I, I, I support you 
from the city standpoint because we're going to be doing this with other projects in affordable housing with the planning and, and CRA too because our we, we're in a housing crisis with rent and purchase it's almost impossible to live here anymore so I'm going to be advocating real strong whether you call it a political year or not real strong for uh, assistance to people for rent and um, uh, purchase of homes with the help of the city versus helping uh, uh, the development community with over funding them so please continue what you're doing I'm I'm I'm, I'm so impressed I, I could sit here for the next 10 minutes but I'd be repeating myself so you got my support 100 percent thank you so much Ditto. thank you yeah, no, and right now, honestly, with the construction cost and the rents that you're saying, it, it's even more important because for the market rate developer, right, all of these increases, yes, they feel them, but at the end, they can kind of translate it into the rents, which is something that we really don't have the ability to do. And, and that's what we've been seeing throughout Florida is the renters are the ones who get. That's what's driving up rent. Yeah. They build them, they sell them. They build them for 20 million, sell them for 76 million. Now you got a real estate investment trust that owns them that has to increase the rent. Over next to my, um, uh, I, I'm getting phone calls almost every day that the rent is, was $2,700 in the apartments right next to this park that we're building. $2,700. It was, a, a, you know, elevated and see the river, but now it's going to 4,000. I said I don't, I don't know how anybody would even pay that unless you just got more money than you, you need. But you wouldn't be calling me if you had that, right? And I said, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, if I could, I'd put a moratorium on it. Uh, but uh, call your state legislature. It's out of control in this area right now. And we need to do what we can with affordable housing, credits, whatever we can do. And we need to focus on that on, on, and, and expend all of our money in that category versus uh, uh, market rate. We're, we're out of control in that. So that's my little speech call it uh, political whatever you want but uh, affordable housing is only affordable housing if you make the promise and act on it not just say it <clears throat> thank you and I, I agree with the affordable housing we've been on here we've done several things and, and some of the questions I ask in the past and um, with some of your company was because the information was coming out a little incorrect and when it came down to what was done was exactly the questions I asked. So I know there was some angst a few years ago, but it wasn't because I was against what you were doing. But I thought if, you, if you've ever lived in a stick-built building that's four stories tall, if you've ever lived on the second or third floor <laughs> with the non-concrete floor, you yeah. get a lot of complaints. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what was coming up. And so I like that. The other one was done in concrete block, which at the time the representative said it wasn't going to be, mm -hmm. and it was. So this being concrete block, I think, is very beneficial to all of us because we hear some of the problems we deal with, some of the HUD things that we don't even control, right? and we've got to deal with them. So if we give a lot of money, and, and again, whether it's a little money or a lot of money, it's still a lot of money, and it still works into helping. And I'm very supportive of that at developing our community. And, and some of the other things, some of the other projects we've done over the years that I've been involved with, whether it's market rate or not, helps us have the money to give to you. Yeah. So the market rates do then put more money in the CRA to hopefully give back more, which then gives back to the city. So there's beneficial everywhere you go. And I think that's what this city has done in all the years, you know, from boards before us, mayors before us, is look at what's the best aspect of growing the city from one left to right not just one individual but but no I think this is a great project I think it really makes our city more walkable you know we're working on those type of things um, which is going to be one of the things we talk about at our city county meeting about how we make our city more walkable with the county's help because if we don't con if we build you as an island there those retail spaces aren't going to work Correct. so we've got to figure out as a community how to keep those things going and, and again one of the goals is from the city to make Riverwalk East down Riverwalk West whatever we call it down Main Street all the other streets in between all the way to, to Lecom 
and it's farther we go. So those are the things that I think this project starts that process and hopefully will help clean up. It grows. When you clean one area, the next area. And I thought, you know, I was glad you said, I think this was something that if we didn't have that one property in the, the south middle corner of it or middle of it, it wasn't going to be right. been, been very difficult. Yeah. So I'm glad that everyone worked together. I know Katarina did a great job at working to get that to happen. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So we need a motion, I guess, that the next motion step. Motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion to approve the land use restriction Second. agreement by Mr. Uh, Sanders. Second by Ms. Coker. Mr. Roth. Yeah, I, I just wanted. It's been said before, but um, you know, this is definitely the, the need for housing, obtainable housing of any kind, right now is probably our top priority. I just firsthand had a, a, a an experience with my uh, daughter and her family to move back down. To the hometown, they almost got squeezed out of the housing market. Um, it's it's just ridiculous out there, and there's no end in sight. So, I think this is one of our top priorities now, not only now but in the future. Um, you know, so congratulations, thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Any further questions, Mr. Perry. I don't want to belabor a lot of the points that were made, which were, were excellent points, but you know, I think this this development is somewhat emblematic about what's happening in this area. And, and, and really, there's never been a more important time probably in the history of Bradenton to really be strategic in planning the redevelopment of the city. Um, we had three realtors in yesterday to the mayor's office that were asking about the uh, vacation rental ordinance. That, that's what they actually came in for. But of course, the conversation swayed a little bit. And, and they pointed out a lot of the things that the dais was, was highlighting as far as the affordable housing crisis. And then we hear that the medium income in Manatee County is 77000 And you really can barely buy a house for three or $400,000. And that means an income, a joint income of probably somewhere on the order of two hundred thousand dollars, and so it's 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 becoming a problem. I mean, uh, we're needs a raise, right? Right. We're, it, we're 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 kind of a you know a, a, a problem of our own success, so to speak. And I was asking the realtors. I said, well, why, why? And there was a multitude of reasons. But some of the things that that really are attractive to Bradenton and what makes it um, kind of a renaissance is that we have water. We have services, we have quality of life, we have business, we have activities. And, and, and when you look at surrounding areas, whether it's North County or, or, um, or far out west and, and the like, I should say out east, um, they don't have all those things. And so I think that's why there's a focus on this urban redevelopment. And when you look at this particular project and specifically its location um, on 6th Ave West and, and, and 9th Street, that needs, that needs a facelift. It, 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 it's a little rough down there. It, it's consistent with what I think you all have been trying to do, what we want to do in the future, what the mayor pointed out with connectivity, with what was pointed out about um, the domino effect of improving surrounding areas and the like. And I just think it's a wonderful project uh, that it has both residential and mixed use commercial walkability potential. The ask itself is fairly minimal. I'm thinking about the MAC, the maximum allowable construction that Delia and HDG has to make work for their pro forma numbers to work. This is probably a 20 to $30 million project is what I'm assuming on construction costs with the land. The ask for us can, is in the area of, as we talked about, a loan for 500 today. I think we have a couple other components in there but it's fairly minimal um, to to see this project and the objectives and goals that it accomplishes are very wide and broad uh, so you know I fully support it both as a matter of today's policy um, considerations but also the future and, and what it can do for the strategies and, and and we probably need to look further deeper real soon at what the goals and objectives are for the city, quite honestly, in, in regarding redevelopment. So I've said enough, but I appreciate Delia coming in. She's been good to work with. She's been a straight shooter. And uh, construction costs are, have gone crazy. Um, and that's why um, Councilor Roth and, and myself that had to get a piece of property here not too long ago said, what's going on? I never knew it was that expensive around here. And, and it is. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, we'll start the vote in Ward 1. Yes. 2. Yes. 3. Yes. 4. Yes. And 5. Yes. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Carries 5 to 0. All right. Moving forward, Mr. McClellan. 
<coughs> Mayor, if I could just do a quick introduction on this matter. Sure. Yes, sir. Yep. So Mr. McClell McClellan is here on a package uh, that's before council, which is resolution 22-9, which uh, considers modifications to the rec recycle and yard waste collection program. Council will remember that we visited this subject, uh, I think a couple months back, uh, and it, it's kind of genesis was the problems we were having overall last summer into the fall with solid waste collection across the board. And specifically this uh, resolution, which deals with two specific programs of the overall solid waste program, which is basically recycling and yard waste. Jim has, a, ha has developed a data package and has information for you to consider um, some, some of the policy changes that are being um, recommended and suggested. And I have had conversations with counselors on particularly one issue regarding yard waste that I think we probably need to talk a little bit about. So with that, I turn it over to Mr. McClellan. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mayor, Council, Jim McClellan, Director of Public Works and Utilities. Um, again, as Mr. Perry mentioned, we are here to talk about this resolution that uh, um, proposes essentially a move away from curbside collection of recycle to centralized, if you will, convenience centers to be located throughout the city. We're proposing 10 of those to start with. It's something that could be expandable as we move forward if we need to. But I wanted to give you some information related to recycling and where we're at and what, what's going on. So as near as I can tell, I've gone back through the records, can't find exactly what date we started recycling, but it was sometime in the 80s that we started recycling. And over the years, we've recycled in a variety of different formats. There was a period of time when we were actually processing recycling in the solid waste yard, so we were double handling all the materials. Um, and there was a solid waste study in 2009 that was performed that recommended we move away from that, which we did. Um, and most recently, we've gone to single stream recycling. So basically, the methodology for recycling has changed over the years multiple times. And the recycled materials themselves have historically been somewhat of a revenue source. Um, back in 1997, I think, the number was about $66,000 a year was generated from, from <coughs> sale of recycled materials. Now, that never fully covered the cost of the recycled division in solid waste. But I want to make it clear, the city has never had a standalone fee associated with recycle that we have charged to the citizens. It has always been part of the overall number and has been somewhat, if you will, <coughs> subsidized by some of the other divisions that pay for the overall operations of solid waste. So what are those costs from recycle? This is the last four or five years of recycle costs. The current year budgeted is on the left. Uh, the gray bar represents the overall cost associated with the division, which is roughly $835,000. Uh, you see a spike in 2020 when we purchased uh, trucks. There was a, a significant investment in trucks at that time. Um, but essentially it's been around 800,000, a little more than $800,000 a year associated with that. Now, in terms of what we've been able to get from the recycled materials, in 2014 and 2015, the blue is commingled plastics, glasses, and everything. The orange is resin, fiber, paper, thin cardboard, and the gray bar is thicker cardboard or larger cardboard boxes. And you can see that we were on the positive side up through 2018. In fact, there was a major spike in cardboard price back in 2017 that provided a significant source of revenue back into our solid waste fund. Then 2019 came, and we, we are now in the negative. We are now paying 75 bucks a ton, no matter what it is, for that material to be handled at a recycling facility. While we weren't making a lot of money before, we're now paying a lot of money now to do the same thing. So what's that impact of the commodity loss? In 2018, just before that switch, it cost us about $20,000 a year to dispose of material. That jumped to 
11,000 the following year when we went to single screen. And we currently budget right around $200,000 a year annually in the recycle budget for the cost of materials going to the recycle facility. So that's a big increase. For reference, tipping charges. Our solid waste, when we take it to Lena Road Landfill, and that's an actual photo from Lena Road Landfill, um, 40 bucks a ton. Again, for us to take it to the recycle facility, and that's what it looks like at a recycle facility, 75 bucks a ton. In addition, our contract with the recycle facility includes for an allowance for them to charge us a surcharge if what we bring to them is contaminated. And to a certain extent, we benefit from it looking like that. Because what happens is our truck pulls in, dumps. Right behind us, a truck from Sarasota may come in and dump, or a truck from Antique County may come in and dump. And it's almost impossible for them to determine whose is what. Mm -hmm. So we haven't been being hit by that additional charge, which is essentially an additional 40 bucks a ton for them to take that material to the Lena Road landfill. That contract says we can have up to 20% contamination in a load taken to the to facility for them to process it. If it's greater than 20%, they have the right to charge us that surcharge of an additional 40 bucks a ton. The reality is somewhere between 50 to 60% of the loads that go to the recycle facility go to the landfill anyway. And more specifically, glass, glass recycle, 100% of the, the facility that we go to, 100% of the glass that goes to that facility <coughs> is sent to the landfill to be used as interim daily cover material at the landfill. And they get about 12 bucks a ton for that material. So there's an illusion of recycle. Mm -hmm. You've all seen the Florida Trend article that talks about it. It's probably one of the most thoughtfully written articles. Mm -hmm. Tells a hard truth for folks. Yeah. Sorry. Our situation is compounded by the manpower issues that we continue to have, shortages of drivers. Solid waste as a whole has 51 budgeted positions. Residential, which includes yard waste, has 30 positions. We currently have 11 openings. We have two people in the, in the pipeline, so we're hopeful. Okay, but still, that's a significant percentage. Commercial has 14 positions, one opening. Recycling has seven positions and one opening. The long and the short of it is, we're down 13 people, and it makes it hard for us to do both yard waste and recycle. There isn't some mass of people sitting there that are waiting to use. And interestingly enough, um, Brian Cho called me last night, our solid waste superintendent, on the way home to tell me she, he had just was sitting there at home watching the news and Channel 8, I believe, had a story that Polk County had just recently renegotiated its contract with its hauler to do exactly what we've been doing, which is off-week recycle, off-week yard waste, alternating. That's the only way that they could, afford, they could produce enough manpower to, s to serve the county. So again, our recycle division, it includes seven people and essentially four trucks. If we go away from curbside recycling, we take those resources and apply them directly to yard waste. Because we have heard from the people, yard waste is their priority other than garbage. Garbage is our first priority and we will always put as many people as we need to on collection of garbage in order to make sure that we pick that material up. So we are proposing that we reallocate our resources to yard waste collections, and the Resolution Institute's yard collection in what we call the three Bs. And I found this perfect picture <laughs> of the three Bs, <laughs> where we would repurpose our recycled blue bins to be used for yard waste. It'd be bagged or it'd be bundled. That can be picked up. I took this picture, it's directly across the street from me. I live out in Mill Creek in East Mantee County, and Mantee County requires bundling. 
And here's a, facility, a home right across the street that lines it all up, bundled, tied for easier collection versus what we see. <laughs> and I got all kinds of these. And these are all just from this week. That's and it's a recycle week. <laughs> yeah. Trees cut down. Here's my personal favorite. There. This is the new game. Right. Find the chair. Yep. Circle it. Yeah. That's what we deal with. A whole tree cut down. Property cleared. Another tree cut down. Give us a chance to pick it up. Give us a, a means to uh, approach it and collect that material. So again, our approach is to go to centralized recycle with containers such as these, that we, they'd be individual one unit. These are 10 cubic yard units. This is the actual unit that we would be buying. It comes with a lock bar across the top to prevent people from going in and rummaging through it. It has a slot for cardboard and a door for dumping of the combined materials. And we're considering putting them at 10 locations. We're still finalizing that. The ordinance talk, uh, excuse me, the resolution speaks of that we would go away from curbside recycling by the end of April, which gives us about 10 weeks to finalize all this. Part of that is in relation to getting delivery of these containers that, that have been ordered, okay? So in some cases, we're proposing to replace the locations where we've got yard waste containers out with these containers. We're, in, we're looking at putting them at each of the fire stations for easy and safe uh, disposal. <coughs> and we're trying to also look at locations where we know there is heavy recycle that is done by people so that we can try and coordinate that. So I'll answer any questions you have, but that's, that's the general approach that we have. I hope I provided you some information that helps. Could, could you... Um, was the slide I wanted to see again first of all I think it's a, it's important that that we share that we've never had a separate recycling fee mm -hmm. this was this was something that the citizens wanted to see us do we started doing it and I I remember when we got the little green tubs in the 80s um, but when, when we go to the recycling in containers, mm -hmm. I do know that Ironwood and Pinebrook does a lot of recycling. And I think it might be incumbent upon us to reach out to them to say, is there a centralized place there that we could look at? Because that is, it's a huge population center. And I know that they have been overflowing when they've gone, when we had to go to the every two weeks. And our, our general approach, in, at least initially, as we were looking at location to put them, would be to make sure that we were putting them on public property so any discussion of those could be handled with individual communities okay. as well. Um, Mr. McClellan, can you address what you and this council has done as far as trying to, um, the incentives that we've set into place as far as hiring individuals as well as trying to match what other for-profit entities are doing? Sure. Um, well, initially, uh, the council graciously approved a CDL bonus. We call it a retention bonus, if you will, basically for somebody to come on board. Um, individuals that were with us for over um, five years, I think is what our number was, uh, were given a $2,000 bonus as a thank you for staying with us. Um, people below that were uh, given $1,000 initially. and at the end of any um, probationary period, we're given the second half of that $2,000 bonus. And that is offered to new hires coming in as well. Um, secondly, uh, most recently, the council uh, approved uh, the increase in the hourly rate across the board for the ASHME members of the Solid Waste Division of $2.74 an hour. Um, and it has had an impact. I mean, up until recently, we hadn't had anybody in the pipeline. Um, so we're, we're seeing interest in us again, so that is helping. Um, but essentially, we've always had openings in solid waste. 
We have 13 openings now. Our goal would be to get to seven, six or seven, where we would be at a functional level to be able to provide what we consider our standard of service. Could you also um, go back to some of the um, yard waste pictures that we've seen? The mm -hmm. um, Having gone out myself several times, as I know that the mayor and his wife has, and I know that you and your wife have gone out on your Saturdays, and I see my trash buddy from utility billing is here as well. Um, one of the issues we have is people doing the illegal dumping of yard waste in our community when they're supposed to be having it removed by the person doing the work. Mm -hmm. can, can we talk a little bit about that and, and what our efforts have been as well as, I, I, I mean, I can tell you there's been times that, that we pulled up to a, a trash pile. Had it been appropriately bundled, we would have picked it up and been gone. Instead, it's taking us 15 and 20 minutes to try to get all of this stuff picked up and put into the, the trailer or the, or the um, truck. Yeah, I, you know, as part of uh, the previous resolution on solid waste that, that was passed, uh, we included language in there to, to indicate that basically if you cut it, you own it. So if a facility, you hire somebody to, to do the work in your yard, um, they own it. It's their responsibility to take it away. And so our clean city coordinator is driving the city on a regular basis, making contact with some of these people and letting them know that that is, that is how we are going to be enforcing it moving forward and letting people know when you hire somebody they are responsible for taking it away. Miss Barnaby, not to interrupt you, but if you look at this picture, it looks like their gentleman they're there. in the left yeah, is a there. service, right. and they're putting it by the road. Right. And again, I don't know if that's city property or what, but you see that happening a lot. Right. Yes. And, and again, there's, there's some virtual piles that we've seen over the last several months that are almost impossible to pick up by an individual. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you try to then, then we have to, deploy the claw truck and all of that so um, and again if if you know you look at some bigger stumps in that or tr trunks there's times that there is no way the homeowner moved that yeah. stump from where it was in the backyard to the front yard well my personal favorite I was driving around uh, last week looking for some things to take pictures of knowing I would be presenting to you and I saw um, two locations where people had placed an entire palm tree, 30-foot trunk, not cut, just laying out at the curb, come get it. Um, you ever that's a bit a palm much. Tree? Yeah. <laughs> You've lifted a palm tree, you know it's virtually impossible. So, Mayor, if I could just interject and, and draw some attention I, I think the operative uh, section of this particular resolution is one uh, section one it's going to be under s sub B which is yard waste in the three categories about uh, about I one two and three basically and uh, we're proposing the three B's but there has been discussion about the last one being bundled uh, you look at some of these photographs, and, and obviously they're not in compliance for a multitude of reasons. Um, the issue comes down to the, the bundling, and we look at it to say that this community has become accustomed to a superior service of yard waste pickup, and it's good that we have um, in, in a lot of ways. It's just that there are a number of abusers of that, and these photographs are probably depictive of, of the the, the, the more egregious type abuses and the like. Um, it, we also have to consider that the clean city component that we implemented about six months ago with the onboarding of Mr. Mora, and he's been very active. I spoke with him in length Friday night. You know that you and Mr. Mora and I used to work together in Albuquerque, and he serviced 300,000 accounts, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but, but he gets out in the street. He's good with people. He's focused a lot of attention, particularly on the east side near River area, uh, Councillor Sanders, and with bulk waste, uh, a lot of the bulk waste items 
items that we're putting up. And, and, he, and he gave me really good feedback to the extent of we revised the bulk waste uh, ordinance where basically reduced the rates to $10. And he goes out and says, you know, we'll pick this up for $10, but you have to call the number. And, and really, virtually, it's, it, it, there's a lot of compliance, I'm told. Um, after he has the conversations with people, they kind of didn't know. And, and in a lot of cases like that, and there's the more egregious types of violators that he has to basically say, you know, we could come and find. And uh, this could be a pretty expensive undertaking for you. And some people give a little pushback, and James has a little convincing persuasion going on. And, you know, hopefully things get taken care of. I have been told by a few people, and I think Mr. Sanders and I had some conversations about it. It's looking a little bit better out there, with, with the bulk waste at least. Now, these types of piles, you could apply the same type of enforcement to, to, the, to a certain extent. Um, as it relates to the egregious violators. There also has to be public awareness, obviously. We like the three Bs because we could put a four by eight vinyl on the side of our, those big heavy 60,000 pound trucks that say, remember, four Bs, blue bin, because we're getting out of the recycle, hopefully, and we have now a receptacle. You put a vinyl sticker on that, yard waste only, so that people isn't putting the other stuff in there. The bagged, the second component that's in the ordinance, uh, the resolution under Section B. And it's the third one regarding um, bundling that, that is somewhat problematic. There's a couple of different schools of thought. I start my, my points about we do kind of pride ourselves on our superior um, service that's provided. And then the other school of thought, the counter school of thought, is more... Um, why don't we handle it from an enforcement perspective because there is a lot of growth in in Florida particularly during growth season and and the like and we're open to suggestions including perhaps amending language that would include things like recommending bundling or, or something like that so I, I just want to point out that there there has been some differences of opinion that are, the well-founded uh, uh, good legitimate policy um, robust opinions on this issue, and I think that's probably uh, uh, the, the, the gravamen, the gist of what our discussion will hone down to. So, Mr. Perry, when when you ask about the bundling, and I mean, I'm I've been back and forth on that over all the years, um, but with the last couple of months of going out and seeing kind of some of the things that have been done, um, and virtually impossible for the homeowner to move those piles to the road you know i mean it, it, it it's again there's a lot of us that do that and jim knows over the years where i've lived and that we've done some of that but we did it ourselves as the homeowners we didn't hire a company to do it and then haul you know put it out um, but are you saying that if in this policy resolution if we put one of these piles out with if it's the homeowner and we call and say hey this pile needs to be picked up it will still be picked up for ten dollars, and there's no bundling. Or no, that's, okay, that's what yeah, I want. That that's got a little confusing. Ten dollars. So okay, is bulk items. So that's yard, not yard waste. Right. Yard okay. waste is basically charged on cubic feet per right. se, and it depends on whether it's residential, commercial, or the like. And, and that's in, in some of the other sections right. of, of it. Um, and so, so it, you know, excessive yard waste basically. Yard waste piles consisting of tree stumps, large branches over six feet, this is under subsection C, in length, uh, or three inches in diameter will require special collection by city boom trucks and be subject to a special collection charge of $16.86 per cubic yard and $336.20 per 20 cubic yard truck load collected. The problem becomes is that it's also time consuming and, the, and, and I think you have to be very mindful of the time constraints because we have a limited resource. It's called man hours. That's what our mm -hmm. flow, uh, our, our, our throat throughput capacity is. And if we had these things that are really taking a great deal of time, these piles, um, it would minimize our throughput capacity because we will be ho hopefully redeploying our recycle assets to yard waste, ultimately, but the charge is a little bit different. Um, James would go out probably, uh, maybe, maybe other folks, with, with a, a tape measure and say, mm -mm, no, over six feet, doesn't fit in the free stuff, you, you're now going to get charged. And, well, you know, people would probably balk at first and James would have to say, Mr. McClellan and Mr. Cho, what do we do as far as 
enforcement, and and that enforcement could be either if it's a, a egregious serial type violator that, that, that constantly has a pile, um, they probably would would have a higher level of enforcement. Someone that just happened not to know, you know, I think we'd try to work with them. Yeah, and that's why I asked that question because I knew the answer to it, but I was that got a little confusing, I think, for as people watch this meeting. But one of the things that that I think is, and I have a picture that I pulled up again. Um, we all have seen those cactuses with the little round come off. They're really heavy. They got the spikes all over them. Mm -hmm. One of the residents we went to in Ward 1, um, they had basically taken about, I don't know, 100 of them and just individually dumped them right there and expected us to pick it up. And, you know, again, if we had the bin, they would have hopefully put them in the bin. They obviously had to put them in a wheelbarrow or something to walk them out then to dump them. Um, and that was, you know, it was not only dangerous because you can't hardly pick them up and, you know, they wouldn't stick to a shovel. And, you know, it was, just, it was an interesting. It really opens your eyes when you're seeing that. So I, I can imagine what our guys see day to day. But, and I did some unscientific research and some of my friends in the county and all of that. And um, they do not have, you don't see the piles as much around the county of yard debris to get to some of these where they're almost dead because they've been there a long time. Because if somebody does cut theirs, they either bundle it, do it cor correctly with the county rules, and then if a tree service comes, there isn't that option maybe of abusing the system a little bit. So, but we still are gonna have, if I do cut a tree down, I still will have the option of, if I can roll the stump to the road and get it there, there'll still be the option to call and maybe pay a small fee for it but get it hauled off without bundling it. But the little stuff would be bundled. And if I can't cut the tree down, I can't bundle it either. So, but if, if, if somebody else cuts the tree down, they should bundle it when they cut it down or haul it off. So that's what we're kind of looking at. And that's why I said I've been back and forth both ways. Mr. Brown. But, um, yes, sir. Mr. Roth. Yeah. Um, um, so, so you guys know, where this story came from, I, I handed this to Mr. Perry, looking at it at 629, um, that's when we hired him. And I, I found this, and I was immediately looking, because I, I told him when we, when, we, when we hired that this is the biggest problem we've got, is this new, our new trash collection. And I was looking at this as a solution. I've known for years that our recycling uh, 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 operation is not going in the right direction. Um, it, it's, it's getting worse by the day and I just see it as a wasted resource to go ahead and do what we do do as, as Mr. Uh, McClellan said you know I, I, I spent 20 years um, as a private uh, private business in the green industry in this area um, in, in Bradenton proper prior to the 16 years of, of being elected a, a representative here I, I know that the citizens, the, one of the things the citizens, our citizens love and brag about is that they can put their clippings out for the, uh, for the city and they'll pick them up. It's, it's always been that way. It's, it's just one of the things that we do very well. When I came up with the idea of, of getting rid of recycling, I, you know, I knew that there'd be kickback and all that stuff, but if it's, if it's a waste, and I know it is, I know that we're, we're, we're wasting time we're wasting energy, we're wasting manpower, because at the end, a lot of this stuff's going straight to the landfill. And I, I know this just from walking around my own, my own neighborhood. I, I painstakingly recycle proper, but I know my neighbors aren't, and I know that all that stuff's going to the dump. And that's just, it breaks my heart. So I will gladly haul it to a proper recycle center to make sure that it's being recycled. A waste of anything is a waste. A waste of manpower, a waste of trucks, a waste of rubber, a waste of engine wear and tear. And most importantly, a waste of carbon. That the, the, these trucks are, are emitting diesel and it's going into the air. So here we are trying to clean up the environment and we're putting needless carbon into the air uh, and for nothing because it sucks going to the dump anyway. So I just, I just see this as a, as a means to get to where we want to be. I don't want to see us take away from the citizens something that they're entitled to, in, in my opinion. We've been doing this for years and that's the, the yard waste, you know, most of our people are, are I've always said this, they're, they're just good, honest, hardworking people 
uh, you know, mom and dad go out and do some yard wakes, or, or a little old little old lady goes out and clips her stuff and puts it on the curb, and it gets picked up. We've always done that, and I'd like to see that we continue doing that. Um, there are gross violators out there. That's just that's just all there is to it. They need to be dealt with. I've said that before on on bulk items, but also on yard waste. Look, if you've got a uh, if you've got a, a, a an oak tree laying on the curb. And there's not an oak stump nearby. Guess what? That got held in. If you got palm prawns on on the curb, and there's no palm tree on the property, that all got held in. So we we can deal with this, but I I don't want to get this into a situation where this is the one thing that we are we do so well that people really love, and we're taking something away that um, you know they're used to because there's some bad apples out there and we're dealing with um, and we're dealing with the uh, uh, trying to make this work so I'm I'm proposing that um, we back off on the on the look I know I lived in a county um, before I bought my home in Bradenton and I could tell you waste management loved to come by and say we're not picking that up they would they would I'd watch them go out there and mark measure the bundles uh, you know, and just, you know, and because their most profitable pickup is the one they don't do. And I don't want to see us getting into a situation where we're now copying the county's waste management theory of, uh, you know, discouraging people from, um, uh, you know, uh, we, that we don't want to pick their stuff up. So I, I just think that we're doing a lot. We've thrown a lot of money at this. We've thrown a lot of resources at this. We've thrown a lot of time at this. Uh, I know that you know. Look, this is what we do. Um, that's like complaining about, um, uh, you know, hey, a water main's broke, and we got to get through all that dirt to get to it. It's part of the job. Uh, I just don't. I, I, I don't. I think we're going too far. Well, I respectfully disagree that it's our do. job. I know you do. Uh, you know, I know we, you do, Jim. And, but and but guess what? I set policy. I know you do, and sir. you perform policy absolutely so, like, so we're allowed to disagree absolutely but this board is the policy makers not you understood and all, you. all we're asking for is for the citizens to give us a chance to pick it up give us a shot at being able to pick it up not have to dig through a pile of reclinatas and not, and thorns in arms not, in order to pick it up I I, I I said there's abusers out there there's there's, a there's way many there. abusers there's there's yeah I'm so, uh, yeah, I agree. You have the right to write the policy. So. Can I speak? Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Ruffer. Um, and, and we may end up needing to be here. Um, we've been discussing this, as Councilman Roth said, for quite a while, and we've discussed at quite a few times about educating everybody. And I'd like to know what has been done, because I get a lot of calls complaining about watching the collectors put the recycling into the regular truck which would make me think they probably weren't doing it right and so maybe i mean we talked about door hangers we've talked i don't know i, I feel like the education is going to be required regardless even if we end up back with this ordinance like this i feel like um it's going to take education because i think people are going to feel really um like they lost an entitlement and i i it just seems a little bit i've also had some conversations from people that have moved from other places that have successful recycling where they they allow um, people in the community um, to take care of it to get you know it's going to be a different kind of recycling program but getting the plastic to the right person that makes playground um, surfaces or you, you know I, I know that sounds like a lot but I, feel, I ju it just seems counterintuitive to just load it all into the landfill still um, and it may take education and like I said we may need to come back to being at, at this but I just am very concerned about taking this all away from the citizens right now I really do and um, I, I agree there are probably a lot of abusers some of it are abusers thinking oh the city picks up everything and they need to be educated again with red tags door tags I, I know there's a lot of communities and especially in my ward she brought up some in hers that are going to be very upset about losing some of this and I think we could go to uh, HOA meetings I'm happy to go into my community and educate them um, if you give me the right information because I can't say that I know everything I didn't always wash out all my 
recycles until I knew about it or pizza boxes and that kind of thing. So I think a lot of it's going to be about education and to just jump to this without at least trying to educate people and get it better. I know, I know that right now the situation is very difficult. And so I don't want to be, I want to be part of the solution, not part of your problem, but um, I'm just concerned about um, just taking it all away from our citizens right now. I think it's going to be really hard. They've, they've kind of gotten adjusted to losing, having it every week. And now we're going to, totally take it away and I mean I like the idea of the cans for the yard waste I think that'll help people judge a little better uh, what they can and can't get rid of and um, and a, charging them a fee but once again I think you've got some real violators and the people that would behave or want to behave aren't being given an opportunity to but Ms. Coker, that's just are you my feeling about yard waste or are you talking both about I'm concerned about taking away the recycling okay. completely. Because, again, we're not taking it away. We're coming up with an alternative method. Mm, I think a lot away. of senior citizens will have a hard time if they're going to have to go drive it to something, uh, you know, rather than just have the key in down for them. I, that's just my feeling. Ms. Barnaby? Well, again, having gone out to do yard waste pickup and have seen some of the things where we've had people that – you know that they paid someone to come they they paid a, a business to cut something down and that business is required to haul it off but they're saying oh i'm in the city if you're in the city the city will take it i mean there was at least three times mr williams and i came up on what was a complete oak tree taken down and you know that the little lady we saw that waved to us and thanked us for picking it up was not the one that cut it and put it there. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think you had a picture of somebody that had raked their front yard. They, ra they had oak trees. They raked their front yard, and they raked everything to the edge of the roadway it was in the gutter. for our people to pick up leaves rather than putting them in some sort of bin or in a garbage bag and I mean we're trying to get as much picked up as we humanly possibly can and if it's taking you 30 minutes at some place to get leaves that someone didn't put in a bag we're not going to get to where we need to be well that's that's what I'm saying. I mean, what have we done to tell the little old lady? You know, when you negotiated to do that, you need to negotiate that they remove it. I, I, that's what I'm saying. I think, it, I think our problem is we all need to be educated, including myself, um, as far as both yard waste and as far as um, recycling. Mayor? Yes, sir. If, if I could be heard, first off, I can tell you, you're going to have another summer like you had last summer if you don't change something. We don't have the capacity. We don't have the drivers. Let's just go back to that 25% um, vacancy factor out of the 51 positions and 13 being um, on the sidelines. And so something has to be done. Number two, I don't disagree with Councillor Coker that we need to do a better job of, of outreach. Um, even if we were to change this, my staff doesn't do a very good marketing messaging campaign. We can do everything we want in here, but if it doesn't happen down on Main Street or 9th Street or, or 22nd Street East, it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? I mean, they need to know it. But the reality to think that if we were to educate that we'll get like a significant amount of compliance, I think that's somewhat of a, somewhat of a fiction from a couple different perspectives. Moore was in charge of recycling rollout. When we rolled out the program in Albuquerque back in uh, curbside 2010, thereabouts, and we spent like TV commercials uh, during the Isotopes games, the Lobos games, in-game features. We did everything we could to educate the public, and we still got massive contamination. That's not because the little lady that wants to do it right isn't doing it right. It's because some people are slobs and don't care. It's that simple. And, and if you give them a bin, they don't care what they're putting in it, as long as it's not in their house or in their garage. You've got to be mindful of that. And, and, and I guess a 
aside from these anecdotal things that I might think or someone else might think, you really got to look at the statistics. Look at the data and that vacancy factor. Look at what happened last summer. We have to get out of one business and concentrate on another, whether it's recycle or, or yard waste or whatnot, because we don't have the capacity. We're in a labor market with CDLs and everything else, it, what Councilor Roth talked about, about the delirious impact of this with carbon and with, with, with garbage on the streets and our community looking like crap and all the neighborhood calls we get and the emails he has to answer, the time that takes and everything else, that's the byproduct of not doing anything. And I'll leave it at that. We may have the same byproduct from doing this is all I'm going to say. So I hope the education is going to be out there. I think that a lot of people, it's going to be the different people, <laughs> but there's going to be a lot of people, especially in my ward, I think, that are going to have a problem. And, and, I, and I agree with that. And I do think that the, the messaging for the recycle has to be better. We have to look at those areas where it's most convenient so that if people would travel to put it in there my area too harbor island i mean i ran down there i think it was a couple mornings ago i've never seen such neat recycling in my life so when we do away with that i'm going to get emails about why mm -hmm. I, I i i get it our neighborhood looks fine and it does but go to councillor sanders go to councillor coachman's go to some other places in the city they don't look so good Mr. Sanders. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I moved here in 2010, about 12 years ago. I questioned, not very loudly, w why the city was so uh, freely picking up yard waste like we are. So I took advantage of it. I cut down every tree I could find in my yard, and I hauled it right to the, to the, to the front, and they picked it all up. And I said, That's, that saved me several hundred dollars. So I think anybody that gets a, uh, uh, a permit uh, should be required to do that, number one, because you do have to get a permit to cut down certain trees, especially oak trees, I heard. So that, that commercial enterprise is getting a fr freebie from us, and it shouldn't be allowed. And I'm not saying if you've got a dead tree in your yard, you can't have somebody cut it down, but you've got to place it out there, and you've got to call Public Works and get it approved when you can pick it up at a selected time so they can bring the boom truck over and there is going to be a fee for it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I saw. That's what's in the other communities. The bundling up sometimes is a problem, but um, <clears throat> you can save it and, and put it all out and then call and ask for a, a truck to pick it up and that it requires an extra fee. If, but I think you can put most of it in this bin. And we're not going to charge more for that bin, are we? So, so basically, you're getting free pickup of your yard waste. Go put it in the bin. If it don't fit in the bin, cut it up. Make it easy for them to grab, throw in the truck. If it's more than that, I, I don't know, six foot, I don't think they need a tape measure out there measuring six foot. Oh, it's 5'11", let's, let's don't take it, whatever. You know, anything that's not bundled has to be picked up by a truck because it's it's it requires more labor to do that that's my personal opinion um enforcement is going to be uh, enforcement and communication is going to be very important this is not going to happen very quickly um so i'm in favor of of the yard waste thing and the recycling uh, we all know it's all going into the dump uh, because this is not uh, uh 1995 and recycling is is a uh, recycling is is it's just not happening and we're paying an awful lot of money for this uh for something that's just obviously going to the the, the waste uh anyway and to be clear um if if a municipality takes their recycle to a incinerator mm -hmm. that counts as recycle mm -hmm. according to the state so um I'm agreeing with this. Uh, I've, I've got some notes here and listening to other people. Enforcement, uh, non bundle, a non bundle fee is by a cubic yard. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can bundle it, it's free. Mm -hmm. You don't have to bundle it, it's going to cost you. But, and then you've got to schedule it. Correct. And I don't know that we're going to be scheduling it every week, maybe once a month, twice a month. I don't know. That's some operational things that you'd have to work out. 
because you don't want to have a boom truck running around town every day because now you have to have a driver and they're all over the place maybe it's a certain time of month maybe twice a month i don't know well that boom truck is also traveling around the city collecting bulk items as well bulk items as well yes okay so they can pick up the bulk items with with the uh, limbs no, no the, you the, have to separate them because when you take it to the dump they have do to them on different days or have on to do different, them on different, different days trucks. yes so i i think you need to have that those things scheduled Here, here's the problem i see at, at every time I walk, go down the street, I see another dresser, another mattress, another this. Sometimes it's at the same house. And it's, man, they must buy a new mattress every week. You know, really. Like, <laughs> uh, and that's not the case. I know what the <coughs> case is. Their friends have a mattress on the other side of town or out of parish or whatever, and they bring it over here and dump it out, and the city will take it, right? Absolutely. So, okay, fine, but we're gonna pay a, you're going to pay a fee for that. And, you know, and, and sometimes the, I think the driver – We'll have to say, wait a minute. I think we just picked up a, a mattress here last week. You know, maybe a door tag that says uh, one mattress per uh, month. <laughs> Whatever that happens. That and we had a guy come in here and said that uh, he was going to the dump and he saw a mattress and he picked it up and he took it. And he thought, I'm a good neighbor. He says he comes back and there was another one. <laughs> he says, now wait a minute. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, you know, we've got to address this. So. Those are the things that, that I, I think that $10 is absolutely cheap. Mm -hmm. $10 pick up a dresser, a mattress, whatever it is, is absolutely cheap. If you don't like that, then take it yourself because you're going to have to have a pickup truck. You're going to have a dump fee. What's the dump fee for some, a mattress? Um, 20 I'm not bucks? Sure. I'm not sure how much they. Do you know, Brian? How much? Back to 20 bucks. So you got your truck, your personal truck, or somebody else's truck, so you got it for 10 bucks. Guess what? That's that's good. Yeah, yeah. You, you got you got a deal, uh, and, you know. And I'll take my stuff out to the road because I don't want him. I can't even get out there and back it. Five dollar gallon of gas. We we have recognized that. So, and then I don't want to you know, scratch my pretty face at putting that thing in there. Whatever. So, <clears throat> now here, um, the commercial operations are profitable. Yes, I've heard you say that. Have we extended those? Or are we? We or should we be should we be offering that to more businesses or, or are you already? Um, we're we're below we're below fees of, of of Race Pro and others, aren't yeah, we? Any facility that comes in for you know development review, we talk about how their solid waste is going to be handled and whether it's a dumpster or compactor or whatever. And any of those facilities, whether it's Waste Pro, Waste Management, or Bob's Fly By Night right. Solid Waste Company. They all play a franchise free in order to be able to provide that service within the city of Bradenton if, if somebody chooses to use them. Okay. Um, so you said this was about 800 and some odd thousand dollar cost savings. Is that true? It's 835,000 is our budget for, for the recycle division. Recycle division. Correct. So, so that's, by the, doing that's this, the seven people and the four trucks and everything associated with it. Okay, them. so by now we're going to convert that to uh, yard waste. Mm -hmm. So what's the true savings? Well, we're already doing yard waste. The, the true savings um, is probably a net wash because you're applying the same people. You're still going to have recycle, so you're going to have material that you're going to pick up and collect and take to a facility for, for disposal. Yeah, but you're doing that anyway. No, no, no. I'm saying with the dumpsters. You're, you're no, 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 no. No, I mean, you're converting the green bins to now what I call in other communities, blue brown, bins. brown blue bins, bins, waste. So you've now, you don't have to pick up the green bins. In it. You have to pick up the green bins, but now it's got waste in it versus recycle. Okay. The blue bin. The blue bin. The blue bin. The blue bin. I mean, whatever. You, so th th there has to be um, a net uh, gain there. By we're only pick, we're not picking up recycling except at those designated locations, so we are saving. Uh, you said eight hundred thousand. Well, we are I saving say, something because I would say uh, you know best case scenario you'd be saving roughly half the cost of your disposal for the items. So if you were doing that, it's two hundred thousand somewhere in that. I'm, no, we're, we're budgeting two hundred thousand, so you'd save about eighty to one hundred thousand. Well, you're not going to have to have that as many trucks, are you? Or are you requiring well, something? Again, you have to have the trucks. The, the issue, okay. the issue is manpower. Man. Okay. So, so I saw Brian, you had, you had seven there the for recycling, and you already had some for yard waste. 
So isn't that no, no? That's the, the same. That's the mis misnomer. Okay, it's the same people. Right same people. Brian starts the day. Here's how many people I have. He first designates the people that he has for garbage and commercial pickup. Whatever's left is able to do yard waste and recycle. In a perfect world, you'd have enough to do both of them. We don't have a perfect world anymore. We have a set amount of people that are left over. It may be two people. We got 10 trucks, but we got two people. Or it may be four people. When we have four people and we can put the four trucks on the road, we can do a whiz-bang job of recycle and or yard waste collection. But it's not always that case. So there isn't, there isn't some place where there are people who are not going to be doing something anymore that are going to be doing something else now. We're just designating that that's all they're going to do <laughs> instead of this other thing. All right. So uh, net sa there may be a net savings of, you think, $200,000 $200, $200, or something like that. Uh, 100000 would be the most, I would think. Probably the most. Okay. So how, how are we going to use that money? It's going to be it's going to be applied towards yard waste operations. So again, all we're doing is uh, public w works, w uh, water raises. <laughs> They're enterprise funds in there. Yeah. So so they can't be commingled. But ir irrespective, the 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 hundred thousand is covering overtime costs because again. Even with this, there are, there's still not enough people just yet until we get more drivers. So we're, we're burning overtime that is just using up the budgeted money that we had for all of these 13 positions. So the, the budget that's in there for salaries, health benefits, all of that, that's in a pot. We're using that to pay for the overtime for all these people who are, instead of working from 6 o'clock in the morning until three in the afternoon, they're working from six o'clock in the morning until six o'clock at night or later sometimes on a regular basis and we're burning them out. I understand and that's why you have turnover and, and nobody wants to do that and that blah, blah, blah. But we, have, we obviously saw what a pay raise will do. Mm -hmm. Pay raise uh, gets performance. It always has, always will. And you gave them a $2.74 an did. hour and $2,000 bonus and I guarantee you money motivates. You know, and anybody that wants to argue that point with me will see you outside it later after the meeting. But so I, I, I'm just I'm always an advocate for that because sometimes we don't understand our own problem because we don't want to we don't want to see it. You know, so I'm 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 there. Uh, what? No. Oh. Um, so um, I'm in favor. <coughs> Ms. Coachman. Thank you. I had some things to say, but it'll be belaboring what has already been said, and you just about touched on something that I just simply want to put out there. We are the friendly city. Um, our citizens are probably feeling, like you said, a little entitled, so changing these things, we're probably going to get a lot of pushback. But as I've said before, it's very important for us to be a friendly city to our citizens and our employees. It's a safety issue. Yes, making more money will motivate, but it's still not the only thing that we should focus on when we're talking about safety for our employees. So that's it. Ms. Barnaby. I agree. And one, one other Ms. point. Oh, Ms. Barnaby has something. Okay, all right. Um, Mr. McClellan, one of the things that I wanted to have touched on today was the conversation about recycled glass and how they are now using it at the landfill as, as a, a weight, right, because as you, you have looked into it, there is not a single facility in the state of Florida that will recycle glass. Is that correct? That is what I have been told, yes. So we can't recycle glass. We're having a hard time getting everything picked up. We're burning through staff. We have tried to work uh, by increasing not only the hourly wage, we've done retention bonuses, we've done signing bonuses. Uh, we've done many of the things that a private industry would, would try to do. And we still are having significant issues. And it's not just us. Well, yes. Let's be clear about that. It's not just us. Um, 
I had a conversation with the gentleman in charge of Manatee County Recycling. And he's telling me that when the two contracts for waste pro and waste management come due, he expects to see some major changes in the services that the county will be looking at in those contracts. Some yeah, major I, changes. I would suspect you'd see something very similar to what Polk County just did. That, you know, in order for their providers to be able to field the proper number of personnel, there have to be changes to the methodologies that things are picked up. Mr. Barnaby and cost increases also, in, in Mr. The, Sanders. Yeah, in the le just so that so in my mind when you say it in in legislation, I don't know where it's at. It may be already dumped by now, but there is legislation that third-party vendors do not have to comply in hurricane emergencies. So if you've got the waste pro out there, they can say, "I'm not doing it," I, I, you know, and I've got a law that protects me. Whereas if you got your own people we require them to do it so I don't know where that's legislation where it's been dropped or not but it, it was there I, I'm not following every piece of legislation but that is one that would hurt us or uh, hurt us if we went to that uh, third party vendor. third party and I remember a time when we had hurricanes that mr. McClellan's group worked 32 days straight without a break mm -hmm. to pick up garbage and yard debris that had come down in the hurricanes Yep. Anyone else, Mr. Roth? So uh, here's the scenario. Um, you got a little old lady who's got a royal palm. Royal palm for self-cleaning. Mm -hmm. The frond drops down. They're, they're usually not very heavy. So you oh pick it up boy, and drag it to the car. Have you? Oh, boy. I've done this, guys. I, I, yeah. I, 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 do, so I do it every day okay. in my front yard. So, there. so you, can, Mr. Roth is. you can drag it out there. So now you've got a palm frond that's like, you know, four and, and 12, you know, maybe 16 feet long. Mm -hmm. The, the, uh, uh, the clam truck or the, uh, the the compactors you stick it in there it crunches down it goes in through it um, what's what's going to happen with that my guess is that we would still pick up palm fronds individual palm fronds the for instance so the vast is, the vast majority of been, palm fronds that are out there what I've been arguing about is the, the majority of I, I don't I'm not opposed to most of what we're talking about here um, but uh, palm fronds create a issue and they're part of our lifestyle and 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 you know what we're very lucky to have these royal palms in our area because they're they're gorgeous and they don't grow in Tampa and the majority so, of the palm fronds that are out there are in public right-of-ways and there are our responsibilities anyway right. so so we're, we're getting there so this is this is what I'm concerned with is I'm trying to protect the citizens as we're trying to move forward and trying to make this function um, you know what what are we doing what are we doing well what are we what are we falling behind on what what is not working you know I've been analyzing recycling for a long time it's 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 not working um, and I'm looking at the resource that we can use the men the trucks the fuel and do it into what we do do well of we pick up this is Florida we we have beautiful lawns we want them to be well kept we don't want unkept properties so how do so basically trying to not that we're going to get a net gain that we can continue doing something, you know. So I'm I'm willing to go and, and and bite the bullet on getting rid of something that's not working so that we can continue doing what we do do well. Palm fronds that's it's one of my major issues. I don't really have problems with the rest of it. It's it's kind of the exception to the rule, but there is no exception to the rule here. Mr. So, McCollum, I, I just, and again, I'm going to speak from my own personal experience over the last couple months. Most of the <coughs> residents where we picked up the palm fronds, it was a one-off. There yeah. wasn't 50 of them. No, I, I, so I, I don't I, anticipate I, our drivers driving by a palm frond. But Gene, there's nothing not in bundled. here that says a one-off. That's that's right. what I'm concerned about right. is, is right. that the wording is that there is no, there's no exception to the rule for but the again, person the that's not causing... Palm issue. palms are just, you know, they fall from the royal palm. And it's, for cabbage it's palms. It's huge, and it's, yeah, and the cabbage palms, but you're not getting, I know. You're not getting 20 of them at once. You know, now, that if somebody came and cut down a tree and cut those, it should right. be bundled. But the one offs, I didn't anticipate that they would, and, if one and, palm from is laying there, how do you bundle it? And, and, right. and something right. that was said earlier you was, yeah. and oh. something that was said earlier was that if a guy come, you pay someone to come cut down a tree that they can put it out, they're not allowed to put it out. 
if someone comes down and cuts your tree out, they have to haul it away. That's not being enforced. I mean, we have we have an enforcement problem that's not being followed. Agreed. Agreed. And that, that will solve a significant portion of the issues that we deal with. But that, that on its own, it's going to solve it because the first no. time that somebody cuts it down and doesn't bundle it, the next time they're going to know that the caller has to haul it off. Right. So some but of it, that is our education. Yeah, but some and of I had that down there as a question. Right. I think Mr. Perry said it, but maybe he just misquoted. You can still take that cut tree to the curb. Uh, yeah. For a fee. For a fee, but it's uh, that's not just a that has to be a, a higher fee, surely. Well, no. If you if if an individual if Mayor Brown decides he's going to cut a tree, no, he doesn't have any anymore. Wait, 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 but but he he cuts a tree down his in his yard and wants to put it out at the curb, cut up. Call will pick it up for the fee of the sixteen whatever it is per cubic yard associated with. So we're now offering a service to commercial uh, trees uh, people that the city will do it as as uh, uh, it goes back to the homeowner uh, should it's just a question should we should we be doing that or should that be uh, the feed that the commercial it's, it's a good benefit to a, a tree tree cutter because you know it's easier to walk that thing right to the, the curb than it is to put it in the back of a truck and haul it out there so I'm not so sure that cost is, I don't think it, we should be doing that right. I'm not so sure that answer, cost I don't think that's going to be I'm not clear what the question is. Is that that we're we are, we're still offering people to take uh, for a homeowner for a homeowner not a not a homeowner does it himself not a business well you're never going to know that well that's what we're going to have to ask them and well they're not, I wouldn't tell you right. well as, as Mr. Ruff said you you've got people who pull a tree permit to cut down now not every tree that gets cut down has to have a tree permit so that's right the, there's there's a there's a so loophole forth. there associated I, that's what i'm with saying that. are we making we're making a loophole there or we're just not even solving that problem well we're halfway to solving the problem because currently the way it's been for the past 20 30 years is regardless of what it was yeah. regardless of how big it was we picked it up and didn't charge you Regardless of whether it was two guys on the back of a rear loader th shoving the stuff into the truck or a claw truck coming along and picking it up, it was always But that's no one of the biggest problems I see out there is these trees that are coming from somewhere, probably not the yard that it's in front of. And you can clearly see that, but who's going to argue that point with the homeowner? And are, are we not offering something we probably shouldn't even be offering? That's my, I, 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 I would, I could, I could go either way on this, but I just think that that's a, a, a we're too easy on that. So if you well, the, the problem with that is, as a homeowner, you cut a tree down. Mm -hmm. Are we saying you have to take it to the landfill yourself? No, uh, it, it it you know, but but again, then we get into proof. Well, where's the stump? Uh, well, I ground it out. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was like, uh, uh, I don't know. You can obviously tell if a oak tree has been cut in. This is the resident, and we say the little old lady. You know she didn't do it, right? So I mean that's easy, and and again I think I think we're getting into splitting hairs a little bit with some of it because no, we're no, going to be able to tell ninety percent of the time. No, no yeah. ordinance, no resolution right. is going to be perfect. There's always going to be a way for somebody to work around it. We're trying to minimize it. Tim, if yes, you could round it out, what percentage of this problem do we? would you say you really see? What's the percentage? In terms of how many abusers are there? Yeah. What do you think? A couple hundred? Out of? 16,000. 16,000. Okay. So we know that problem's gonna exist. We've just gotta Still gonna figure out working. some way how to. And, and all we're trying to do is also get around the idea that you know, we hear from you folks about we want to clean up the city. We don't want this stuff sitting out there making the city look bad. And we're trying to get to the best methodology to do that. And we think this is one of the ways that we can get there. Because again, I would love for Brian to go back to his office and find out that there are 15 people lined up waiting to be interviewed and we end up with a full staff and I can come back and go, hey, never mind, right? But I don't think we actually should say never mind. We should change the approach because as you say 
you know, you moved here and said, hey, what's going on? And we have, we have uh, repetition by communities. I get calls from people even now, and I recognize, the, you know, the alternate week between yard waste and recycle. They'll call up and say, there are blue cans up and down my street. Oh, I better put my blue can out. And yet the first person who put it out didn't know it was yard waste week. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. Okay. And then I get into arguments, I shouldn't say arguments, debates with people about, you know, well, you know, we came out and we picked it up. You know, we were running late last week, so we picked it up on a Saturday. And now you think something different is going on. And I recognize all of that provides confusion to the residents. And I'm trying to get to some sort of normalcy. I agree with you. Can I, can I ha see that $800,000 slide again? And you explained how that number, you arrived at that number. This number? This? Yeah. Okay. I think that's it. So 2020, uh, uh, budgeted 2022, which it's is 835,000 uh, uh, total. Is this, this gray bar right here. That gray bar is 800,000 for salaries operation and total cost for recycling mm -hmm. only. But are you saying, did I hear you say that recycling also is yard waste? So that's no. both? It's no. not. So we're going to say. Residential garbage, your green no, I'm bin, not, not, not that cost. This is just recycling only, only. Only. 800000 mm -hmm. So you're going to save 800000 No, you're not. No, you're okay, not. I want to know what you're going to save. Like I say, the only thing I can tell you for sure that you would save associated with this because we're going to reallocate the people. Salaries and benefits are going to be reallocated. Okay. Trucks are going to be reallocated. Fuel is going to be reallocated. All of those other costs. The only cost that isn't reallocated is how much do you actually dispose of in terms of recycle. Right. Okay. I, and I, I, if I, I, in one way or another you're going to dispose of it. I agree, but if you just looked if you just looked at this graph, you say, well, you got eight hundred thousand dollars. Well, it, it, it you explained it that yeah you're, you're going to roll that over to the other, so it's not right. So you, like I said, we budget currently two hundred thousand dollars annually for the disposal fee for recycled materials at the facility that we're contracted with. So yard waste. Uh, yard waste goes to the landfill. What's your estimated cost right today? Yard waste. We don't. Tr we don't necessarily you don't track, ne you it don't track it separately because it's part of the residential rate. I mean, the the one thing I could get you numbers on is how much we actually pay in terms of a tipping cost associated with the yard waste materials. But I don't have that right now, but I can have it provided to you. Right. Jim. So there is, there is a, 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 a cost. I'm not sure 100000 would be the number, but um, because well, I, I'm there is a cost. If, if half of what we recycle now didn't get recycled, that's $100,000. But I'm going to pay $40 a ton for it to take it to the landfill. So maybe it's fifty thousand instead of a hundred thousand. So I'm saying somewhere between fifty and a hundred would be what I would think you'd say. Those seven people that now are going to be allocated the week that they're on recycling are mm -hmm. just going to be allocated for yard waste, basically. Correct. So put that slide week, back. Yeah, but the other week, those seven people were allocated towards yard waste. So it's not like we have seven people <coughs> here, seven people here, right. at fourteen. Okay. We only have right. seven mm -hmm. that are just basically right. washovers. Are, are so doing both functions. Both okay. functions. So right. yeah, that's that, where that's, that's what I was getting at. Right. Like, okay. And I, I recognize that it's confusing because again, it's not necessarily seven. Right. Because I've got seven right. people allotted for recycle, but I may okay. have Brian may have to pull two of them to run on commercial right. or residential garbage, and we're limited in how many people we have. Mr. Roth? Yeah, and um, so Jim, do the, um, the, a lot of the yard waste, I used to go to like resource recovery. Does your, do your trucks go to the county or, or they go to, to the private um, companies that? You go to private? We go to waste pro. Waste pro? Where, where, they, where, they, where they tear the stuff up. They have the big tub grinders and everything, correct? Well, yard waste, yard waste. Come on up. Yard waste. I saw a lot of it over there on 17th Avenue and 301. Well, it, 13th Avenue. 13th Avenue. That was our transfer station, if so, you will. 
So, yeah. Councilor, you're going to find a new place. Your, your, yes. your question is yeah. where where do our yard waste material? Yeah, I mean, go? it's it's not it's not being dumped in the landfill. No, it's, it's being ground up. No, o only a small portion of it goes to the landfill. If it has garbage mixed into it, right. it will go to right. the landfill. Right. Most, the majority, ninety percent of our yard waste goes to Whitfield Road CRR yeah. recycle. Yeah, and they have the tub grinder and they do that. Right. So, yes, so, so, so the point I'm trying to get to is that, that truly, if we have anything that's being that's capable of being truly recycled, it's yard waste. Yes, because it, it's we, we realistically grind, we grind yes, it up, we, if we grind we it up into green, uh, yes, we are right. You, you, the wood the wood turns into mulch. The I, I was in this business. The, the you know absolutely you're going to turn yes, into fuel, but you, you, and, you, and you can turn into dirt. You can make dirt out of ground up materials. So yes, the the pellets get gets processed. The, the large trees get processed into what they call wood pellets, right. which um, uh, energy burners like Jacksonville, city of Jacksonville, they have a they have a thermal burner that produces electricity, and the rest of it gets produced into mulch. Let me just caveat: this assumes that the the curbside yard waste is truly green waste. Part of the problem is when you go to pick up the yard waste problems: the chair, the PVC pipe. <laughs> The, the steel, yeah. the as, construction as, as debris, Ms. Ms. Barnaby, and the like. And, and that is one of the reasons why we are, you know, trying to differentiate with the bundling concept. Not to say we can't handle it, but when we go out, Brian's people over, over um, at the property behind Tropicana where we, we, we put everything, they say, oh, if it's green waste, put it here. If it's construction debris, Greg gets on the deal and moves it with a loader someplace else. The bulk waste, and so that's very time consuming. And, and, and some of you know, the violations are just that. So it's hard to say or paint with that broad a brush that, well, all the yard waste goes to you know, a good purpose of green waste recycling. Um, if it's sep once it's separated, it, it does, theoretically. For sure. So, so my, my point, my point being, I'm, I'm done. So my point being is that I'm trying to do something really well. I, I, I believe that uh, you know recycling. We've been doing a long time. We tell people, you know, the people are going to recycle whatever they think. They think everything's recyclable. You know, I'm watching my kids in my home. You know, everything's recyclable. No, it's not. And, and glass isn't. What's, what's, what's most recyclable? You know, aluminum cans. I mean, you can separate it down to like two or three items. Then you really have a recycle, recyclable material. But what we do know that we do do well is yard waste. We do know we live in South Florida where things grow profusely. So we do know that there's a need for that. We do know that, that, that yard waste is it's completely recyclable if we do it correctly. So rather than doing a bunch of things not well or, or not getting it done because we don't have enough resource, I'm just trying to figure out how to, get, how to get us to where we can do what we're doing well. It's still getting done. And, and, and you know, I think our citizens have been very understanding and patient. I mean, I, I think that they've been really, really good about the, anything that we tell them we need to do, they're, they're going along with it. And I just want to look out for their interests in this whole process. And I think one of the other things that we have talked about as a possibility is for that yard waste pile that perhaps you give a once a year freebie for collection to, to allow somebody to do a, uh, you know, an annual clearing of their yard and put it out at the property and call and this is your one freebie, the next one's going to be at a cubic yard cost. That's easily done. And we educate where we say on, we know when the busiest time is in the summer, and you say on this month of June or whatever, you have one time. Or I mean, there's a bunch of ways you can we do We have it. to come up with it because, again, that would get education confusing, too. Ms. Coker had a... Yeah, um, I think uh, I have, like I've said, I've got a lot of concern about passing it the way it is, but I do also know that the, the definition of insanity, and we are trying to come up with a solution. So I would like, to, I might be feel a lot better if, there were two things, uh, maybe a six month, six month review of this um, after we've gone through it, have a, a mandatory review. And then also, I, I want to see a plan, a, a, an education plan that's, you know, putting people out there to the HOA meetings and, 
and really because we've talked about seriously it's been quite a while since we've said let's educate people about how to recycle properly and i've not heard one thing that i've been told any efforts read we talked about door hangers i don't know if that was done um so that that's that's where i would be on yes. passing this ordinance well i actually think though that jim and, and his department is going to be reevaluating this as we go forward with the bins and locations and all that to see and then also the education is something that i know mr perry and through our pio and and again we have done education through the facebook through the you know, there's been a lot that Jeannie's put out, but unfortunately, I just think that in today's world, people don't see it. It's on the, you know, you put stuff on the cans, you put different things. So I agree that we need to not stop trying. I don't even we mind being on. part of the solution here because, you know, they they appreciate it when I come to their HOA meetings. And I think my ward's going to be very concerned about all this. So if I'm given the right materials and the talking points, I am happy to be part of that. I just want to make sure that we're trying to do that and I believe that's probably that's number one goal but like you said if we keep doing the same thing over and over again we're never going to get better exactly Ms. exactly Barnaby? well I'm wondering now that Ms. Coker has has uh, brought the points up that she brought up and one of the comments that I was going to make is we are doing this by resolution which means we can revisit it mm -hmm. at any time mm -hmm. but I might feel more comfortable if we were to postpone looking at this until our meeting on March the 9th where we could have the education component a, a draft brought forward to us as well as when you will be checking into this and getting back to us the dates if you I'm not sure six months is going to give us a good picture because I think mm -hmm. it's going to take probably six months to get the information out where everybody is starting to focus and, and pull, you know, in the same way. Um, but I'm I'm wondering if um, tabling this until the March 9th meeting and asking our staff to bring us forward a education plan as well as the date for which we would be. Uh, circling the wagons again and looking at this if, if I could be heard on that point I, I, I have no problem with that that's actually a pretty good idea I, I I am a little bit you know being perfectly transparent concerned about our public awareness efforts and I think we implement these things and we go well we'll put it on the back of a utility bill <laughs> and Lance and I were talking and it's like we're not sure people read them uh, frankly we'll put it on a door hanger and it's like, what is this? The window cleaner guy when you get home from work and you know, you see those things on your door about biz small businesses, you know, and, and that there are better vehicles for public awareness. Councilor Coachman was looking at me saying, Why not put a vinyl sticker right on that blue bin? I mean, you've got a surface area that's this big with a top that if you had some graphic artwork on the top, yard waste only. Um, blue bin, bagged or bundled or whatever we want to put on there you know there's a multitude of different things we can do and i think that we do owe it to the public to basically have that before the you know the, the cart before the horse type of thing that we put the horse in front of the cart and have a plan for that that's a pretty good suggestion um we are coming into a growth season as it relates to the review of the, the plan i think that's another good suggestion um, that we review it. I would ask probably that we have it during a seasonal period that gives us both um, a peak and a non-peak. We're coming into grow season, which will be a peak particularly for yard waste. We've kind of gone through the non-peak of the dormant mm -hmm. season, so to speak, uh, and the like. So we got to factor that in. But 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 I, I'm on board with what a lot of the comments are being said. And, and what I would say is, I personally, I think uniformity in the message going to be important and that's why I say give me something give me a, a brochure that I can read from possibly even pass out at these meetings um, because I think uniformity and a clear and consistent message is going to be the most important thing because right now there's just so much out there yes, sir, Mr. Roth. so uh, bagging um, I got a question about yard waste bagging um, because like, I, I know I, I do it, and I've seen other people do it, where we, we use cans. Mm -hmm. so we don't put piles out, and that's just ridiculous. No one can pick that up. 
you put in a can. We're saying bagging. Well, if you put stuff in a plastic bag, if you're putting organic material in a plastic bag, you've just contaminated the organic material. So is it, are you not going to take anything that's not in a blue can, or are you still going to no. take cans that are still full of no. clean, well, organic I think material? the way we, the way it was worded was our preference would be that the containers be wheeled, because the idea is for to speed the process of being able to efficiently collect things, our guys would wheel the container over to the back of the truck, put it on the tipper, the tipper tips it up, puts it down, and away they go. Right. Versus somebody who puts, I don't know, 400 pounds of sod in a, in a container that doesn't have wheels and you got to drag it across and then pray to Jesus you don't break your back trying to pick it up and dump it well, into I, the truck. So, so that's that's the exception to the rule. I'm still asking about like leaves. We're, we're at that time of year right now where Absolutely. the leaves drop. Yeah. So I you put them into a can. Right. The can dumps easily. It doesn't, doesn't weigh anything because it's just full right. of leaves. Is that not going to be or do we have to stick them in a plastic bag no. which now we've just no. contaminated organic material with plastic? No, our, our I'm just trying to be, figure out how this is going to work. Our intent is container, can, bundle. Okay, but not just. And we're just saying because we're we're going to repurpose the blue can, it's a 65 gallon container that right. you can fill up, and we can and, and, we can and, and, easily and I, roll and it I to love the yard. That idea. I will I will use the heck out of it, but there'll be times when I'll have other cans out there too. Understood. It, it's it's a good thing, and then other cities charge for this service uh, fifteen twenty dollars a month, and a lot of people don't do it because they don't want to pay that fee. So you you put your bulk items in the bottom, the tree trunks, and then you put the leaves over top of it. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> just teasing. I'm just teasing. And now we have a big easily rolled. I'm just I'm just I'm leaves. just teasing. Yeah, you say oh it's leaves. I can't drag it over. I understand. All right. So is there a moat, Mrs. Barnaby? Um, just two things. I have seen the <coughs> containers with the leaves, and if they get full of water, they're not as easy to, to get rid of as you think, number one. Number two, I know that there are some individuals that are using reusable containers. Mm -hmm. So we will need to make sure that our staff is trained to recognize what's a reusable container. Because I had somebody say, I had my, re and they took everything, and it's like, well, we're operating in almost emergency conditions. They're trying to get everything done. They just <laughs> took everything. Um, so at this time, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to, and, and I didn't make the motion before because once you make a tabling motion, there's no discussion. So at this time, I'd like to offer a motion to table uh, resolution 22-9 modifications to recycle and yard waste collection procedures until our next meeting, which will be on Wednesday, March the 9th. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Start the vote in Ward 2. Yes. 3. Yeah. 4. Yes. 5. Yes. 1. Yes. And Mr. Mayor, if I may. Yes, ma'am. I would really appreciate having the homeowners associations and the different groups that we serve get in touch with us so that we can share this information with them and get some of their ideas and what they would like to see as well. Yeah, and I think that that's something also that um, through our police department visits probably more HOAs than anybody else. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can get some educational material to them as well. Because you may find an HOA that's willing to put a dumpster in their HOA. And I know that could add to the cost of having more dumpsters around. But if they, they would be more responsible, I think, and also making sure it happens. Because well, most of the HOAs do have... The um, dumpsters are about $2,450 a piece, something like that. So it, it's not an exorbitant cost if, if it became really popular for us to put out. Right, because we still, we still, and I think I've heard everybody up here as well as our staff, we still want to be the good stewards of recycling. It's just how we do it, mm -hmm. different methodology. So okay. thank you very much. A couple of questions. Yep. Um, so are we saying that we'll convert the blue bin to uh, uh Yard waste. What if what if a, a, a homeowner has a smaller private can of their own that they've been putting out? With sometimes are they allowed more, only one, two, five? No, I, I think our intent is it's in one of those three methodologies that they're putting it out, whether it's a bin, a bag, or a contain or bundle, for us to be able to pick it up. Uh, you know, we go, okay. we go out. 
That some picture. you know, <laughs> I, I I I raked my backyard. I got right. two live oaks in my backyard, and I've got six bags of yard waste sitting right. in my backyard waiting for me to put so it. So we're not the limited to just one. That that was one question. The other question is, like for an example, I know Braden Castle has their own yard waste allegedly uh, roll off. Mm -hmm. or, so we're not going to charge additional for uh, the citizens. Are they going to get what? Are they in their because case, they? Yeah, it, I, don't, the, I, I don't believe that. Would they're be not charged now, are they? No. Are they? If they're not charged now, that's that's my question. Yeah, if they're not change. charged now, fine. There's no it change. change. Yeah. Okay. So if the community wants that or HOA wants all just one central location, they can do that. But then of course they'd have. To put the it benefit to the yard waste is we're now going to supply them with a can to use right. to make it easier for pickup, as well as picking up any other bagged bundle or other cans picked up as well and a little easier is that, is that every is that every week oh yeah it's going to go to every week then it's going to go to it's more go consistent to every, be going to every week so we're going to pick up trash and yard waste every week that's our goal oh that well and 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 we're still going to so if, if someone puts out an occasional palm front they're going to be that's going to be picked up or is it going to be a special pickup it, uh, and, uh, I would say palm fronds are ultimately going to be picked up. This is really it, it, trouble. It is, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting because having gone out and done this, if it was bundled or bagged, we grabbed it, it was in the trailer, we were gone. Right. When we had to use the pitchforks and the rakes and, and everything else, that was when we got into spending 15 and 20 and 30 minutes at one home. Multiply that by all the homes in Bradenton. Uh, okay. Uh, a question for our attorney. Uh, we did this uh, resolution in December. 21. So, I'm sorry? Yeah, December 21. December 21st, we did this resolution. So, I've already uh, sent him an email a day ago, and he probably was curious of why I was asking this question. Do we have to repeal that and then resubmit it? or and then uh, the second part of the question is uh this has rate structures in there and i don't know if we changed them and that has a requirement does it not to uh notify the public in advance uh resolutions there, there were no changes to the rates it was all just the way i approached it was to modify the one resolution that we had related to solid waste which talks about garbage recycle commercial all of that in one place including the rates so I modified that in December as it relates to the, um, what we did before. Then I just took it again and modified it again, and, and I had highlighted in yellow where I had changed or deleted things. But we did change rates in December. Sh yeah, Not on solid waste. Yeah, we actually lowered them. The, oh, for bulk items. Bulk yes, items. You're right. so, I'm sorry. Yes, but, you're right. But, but uh, I'm just making sure that we're, we're not you know somebody doesn't challenge us on uh, we did a rate structure i didn't know about it. Well, i don't know how you complain about getting a lower rate but somebody might <laughs> yeah i mean uh, this is a repeal and replace of the entire solid waste rate structure so and you'll see language at the end that says it repeals and place replaces resolutions in conflict so it was intended to be a com the complete one yeah so it should incorporate if there was a prior um, rate adjustment that was done that should be incorporated into this right, right. all right valid question though. thank you very much great discussion any unfinished business mr perry just briefly um i, I think we circulated the uh, council budget letter to several counselors for signature i took the liberty of drafting that and, and i didn't want to be presumptuous but I know that uh, there's th that council itself doesn't have resources to do that so it's for our budget book and there's basically an overview of, of what the budget contains um, I circulated that one of the counselors wanted to speak with me and I appreciate that which I'll, well, which I'll get with that counselor it if you haven't seen it yet or haven't signed it if you could take a, a peek at it it's rather aspirational about what we try to do with our budget for, for uh, the city as it relates to um, the city's needs goals and objectives and the like so that'll be going around it will be published shortly thereafter online 
the delay was related to ADA requirements. We had to get a contractor to basically put it in ADA format once it is posted online uh, or otherwise distribute it. And so that's why it's September. And of course, we uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's February and we, we passed the budget in September. But uh, we'll be finalizing that, getting it circulated. And if you have any questions, please just reach out to me or let me know to come by and I'll talk to you about the letter. Sir. Uh, question. Um, so that's for next budget year, not this current. No, it's actually for this budget year. So we're doing, okay, and basically what does the letter do? The le typically every budget that's submitted by a local government will have a letter um, from the governing body itself, sometimes the governing body and the mayor, sometimes the governing body, the body of the mayor, the city manager, city administrator, and the like. It basically tells what the budget was attempting to do and, and you know the, the high points of the budget. It's a fairly short letter, yeah, and, right. and, and I think you probably read it. Uh, I, I'd heard Corey told me this morning that you had read it and, and uh, just wanted to talk to me about it. it again, it's aspirational. It, it talks about some of the challenges as well as some of the accomplishments and things like that. But it doesn't pin any council person down to, wait, wait a minute, you read it, you approved it. Hey, sorry, buddy, you signed this letter. No, I don't think that, that the letter does that in any way. Um, you know. right. yeah, yeah, you already had a right to change it, and you didn't do it, and you signed it, so it's a done deal. Because I always have the right to change if, if I find something that's not right in the budget, which I look at all the time to see if we're complying or see if, we, if, sure. if we're ahead of budget. Of right. Well, you don't have that right. I don't have the right. The council as a whole has the right to do budget modification for sure. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. But, I, you know, that doesn't eliminate that budget modification if I sign in and says, hey, it's done deal. You're That's correct. Out. Within You're certain right. reasons, if there was bond covenants, things like that, legally you may or may not be able to put if there was a representation regarding certain funding sources. But that's kind of hybrid type stuff. Okay. Yeah. I may want more clarification on that. Well, just like if you if you did have a geo bond that was an ad valorem type bond, and you passed the budget that had the 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 funding to pay the debt service on the bond, and then you changed the budget and said we're not paying out bonds anymore, I'd imagine we'd probably be sued. That, that's 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 kind of what. I'm yeah, talking but I don't about. want you to come up to me later and say, well, you signed this, so, so I that gave me authority. No, I'd come up and say, that? I'd say the council passed the budget, and I have to go with the budget, irrespective of what any one single individual counselor did. Right, but I still have the right to question anything in last year's budget and bring it out and say, hey, I didn't realize yes, that this was in there. I mean, the budget's that thick, you know. Sure. And, and uh, so, but now that we're talking about budgets, I'd like to, I'm asking you, I think you've agreed that we, that we do a, a better budgeting process that rather than at the 11th hour, uh, 30 days before September and, and, and <clears throat> and if, if, if council doesn't want to do that, that's fine. I'd like I'd, I'd like to ha have that so more detailed, and I like the presentations by each department, and uh, 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 you know a question and answer session. Whether anybody else wants to do it, maybe I can do it. If nobody else wants to do it, that's fine. I'd like to do it with you and uh, department heads prior to uh, adoption of that budget in September. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, was yeah. this something that was sent to everybody? I'm sorry? Was this sent to everybody? I believe it was. Okay. A, a while back, I'm told. It was. It might have been through an email. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it was initially. Yeah, through, through I, I, I looked at it and I thought, mm. Oh. Well, Corey can probably address that. Yeah. Ms. Fortin? Oh. Oh, November. <laughs> okay. It's been signed. <laughs> I've signed it. Okay. All right. Anything else, Mr. Perry? Unfinished business? Uh, no. Okay. Thank you. Moving on. Council reports. Ward, uh, starting Ward Four. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, I've had problems since I've been here about contracts, documents, agreements, you name it, that come before the council. <clears throat> at the last minute or the last couple days and I haven't had time to read them. Sometimes they're presented just during the council meeting. So I would like to have a policy uh, uh, vote on this. So I'm, I'm proposing a motion that all contracts, agreements, and or documents to be voted on by the city council shall be presented at a minimum of seven days prior or in advance of the voting of the item uh, and be moved to the next regular meeting. 
Can I comment? There's a motion on the floor. Let's oh. see if it. Okay. Wait for it. Do you um, understand it, Brett? I, I don't know that uh, it needs to be seven days. I mean, what? Okay. How many days? I mean, well, that, we that, that, that I would agree that. Don't we have a rule where anything on the agenda comes out the Thursday before the Wednesday meeting? It does, but it comes out at like 4.30, so you basically lost Thursday. So you got one working day of Friday, Monday, and Tuesday. So you got three working days. If you count the weekend, it's five days. I don't know. Some people, when it comes 5 o'clock Friday, they go to their you know wherever I mean I think I think that what it should be timely enough that, that you have time to read it well I, I think that Thursday does that but I do know that that stuff show up after that and that's not you that, then you have to move it to the next meeting well, okay so I mean so if you want to make many your motion where it has I'm in the motion that if we, we comply with the Thursday we, we, that any document anything we're going to vote on it has a document a contract any type of a document agreement anything that's presented we have to have the opportunity to read it along with that approval of that agenda that's at Thursday at 4 30. Well, I don't think that anything since I've been a mayor has popped up that's a surprise thing on a Monday sometimes oh even like today a lot of times there's CRA stuff that comes on that we don't have the full documentation till Friday there's other stuff from staff members planning different things it's not trying to hide anything it's just when some of the documentation gets done and i think one of the biggest things that this will slow down is it's going to slow down people trying to get they're going to have to wait another two weeks then in june and july they may have to wait another whole month november and december they may have to wait another whole month because of our the meeting schedule so i don't think there's anything i agree with you on some things that are major projects but some of the little stuff the staff is still trying to compile to help the uh, citizen out to get it on there. Well, I can tell you so, two recent right. examples. Mm -hmm. One, when I had eye surgery, a document was handed to me the morning of. And I said, number one, I can't see the, to read it, so I tabled it. The next meeting, Mrs. Barnaby tabled the same thing because it hadn't been reviewed by the uh, our, our city attorney, so we tabled this thing out <laughs> probably a couple mm -hmm. times. Those are the things, examples I'm talking about. I'm talking about stuff that's, you know, if, if, if we want to, well, it's just it's just a protocol that's 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 fair to me, I think, and others, that we get an opportunity to review stuff before we make a vote on it. And that's the benefit of tabling something, also. Well, yeah, but I don't want to have yeah. to table it. It should be a policy that these th these documents are given to me in time to read them, because some of them are, are development agreements, some of them are you know are contracts that are multiple pages. And I may want to talk to the city attorney. I may want to talk to the administrator. I may want to, you know, review this and, and kind of sleep on it, you know. And, and if you don't give it to me timely, I can't do that. Ms. Barnaby? I understand what, what I believe Mr. Sanders is saying. However, let me also offer something that I did in the past, and, and I'm looking around, and I, <laughs> I've pretty much told every department head, if you want me to vote in the affirmative on something, don't hand it to me the day of a council meeting because you're getting an automatic no from me because it's coming up at that point in time. I think if our department heads and our staff understand that we need to have this information in a timely fashion, I, I, I think that, that that helps it. However, you have said in the past that you're a, you're a businessman and that you're business friendly. And sometimes I think doing these, these kind of hard, fast, arbitrary rules in the stand, if it, has, is it, if it doesn't hit my desk a week before the meeting, you, know, you can't bring it forward, is not beneficial to our community. I mean, there's times that, yes, I, I've come down on a Thursday to pick my stuff up so that I know that I have it. Or I come down, if, I, if I'm out of, out of the office on that Thursday, I come on down on that Friday or even that Saturday. And I have found that when I do that, and if I have questions and I reach out on that Monday, most of our staff do everything they can to get that information that I'm requesting to me. Ms. Coker? Yeah, I, I was pretty much about the same way. I, I 
completely agree with the sentiment. I just don't like tying our hands like that because sometimes things do come up and uh, and and like it did, and you were able to table it and it worked. So I, I think uh, I under, I agree with this sentiment. I just don't really want to see it that hard and fast that we can't use our own judgment. Sometimes some things have to be pushed through. That's all I'm saying. Was the uh, motion for contracts? I mean, because that I, I, I said uh, contracts, agreements, and or documents <coughs> to be voted on. In other words, you come up with a. Uh, uh, a resolution that refers to a document that's not present at the time and we should uh, wait till we've seen it because we don't have the full picture I don't have the full like picture this. you know and, and I want an opportunity to get the full picture not only that I want to uh, uh, be able to vet it I might want to be able to vet it with the council and a, or not council but our counselor and administrator and I just think that in some of these deals are major big deals I mean I've seen a couple million dollar deals that haven't had documentation uh, in advance that I could read it and if you want to go to the record I'll be glad to go back and pull it out for you because it's 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 major dollars and those things are the most concerning to me but uh, I don't know why you would not want transparency in that. I, I do. Well, don't I think everybody think wants transparency, saying, and Mr. I think that well, that's why you have five people that vote on it. Well, then, then we then vote on this. I mean, I haven't got a second yet, so this is, is if I don't get a second, then it's dead. So, you know. All right, motion dies for lack of a second. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Sanders, anything else? Oh, I have one more motion. We'll see if this one gets killed, too. Uh, motion two. Uh, any citizen comment may be addressed by the council, mayor, or city administrator after presentation to obtain a clearly and um, a clarity and proposed action to be to the citizen. I've seen citizens come in here and says, "I want this done, that done, blah blah blah," and I said, "Well, wait a minute. I said, have your three minutes. You didn't even answer me." That's disrespectful, I think, to that citizen to come in here and then they say, well, I'm not, nobody called me back. And I, okay, I think as a councilman, I have the right to ask a question if I have clarity on what they're asking for. And two, I may want to direct through the vote of the council uh, to a particular department to look into that and report back to the council to make sure that these citizen comments are being heard and acted upon not just heard and nothing happened. So I know that, that that's been uh, stopped by that they just have three minutes to move on. And if you've got, you know, 100 people out there, you, you, I understand the, the delay process. You can't, you can't give everybody, you can't question everything. But we haven't had that problem since I've been here. So I just ask that, that we have it, that anybody that presents us with a problem, because that's what we're here for, the people. Uh, if we're not, then I, I have a real problem with that. It, I can't ask somebody uh, a question right after they've made a comment that our police department is in violation or our trash not been picked up or whatever it case might be. I think I have, I'm a representative of the city, and I think I should have the, the opportunity to address that individual as a, as, as a representative of the citizens that are bringing that problem to us. Thank you, Mr. Sanders, and, and um, I don't disagree with most of that. Um, we do have a resolution now that's still out there, 21-02, and it talks about our policies and protocol, protocol related to conduct of a council person, and it's, if you look at the public meeting hearing protocol, it goes through, obviously, the mayor will open the meeting and uh, agenda through that, and then it does say council members should withhold comment during the public hearing portion of the meeting till the conclusion of the public presentation council should refrain from arguing debating with presenters during a public hearing should always show respect for different points of view and that's kind of what we're under right now obviously if we want to go through all of these procedures um, and change I would have no issues talking I, about that I agree. and uh, but it is something that is approved right now and the, the the part of it that is is what we don't want to do and we've seen it in other governments as well as ours sometimes when you get into a debate at that time no, it, I'm not asking it, about debate I'm just asking simple questions yeah right well what I mean though is we like you heard today a, a person said something I said please refer to chief gear to talk with them 
-hmm. Another person had come in and said something. Yeah. He's talked with chief. But I also police. heard that yeah. they come back and said nobody called them, and so like, wait a minute. Then then I should have the opportunity to say, right. all right, why did nobody call you back? I don't have a clue. Maybe they're not telling the truth. Right. Then maybe it needs to be okay. Wait a minute. This is the second time you've been here. First time you said nobody's calling you back. Nobody's emailing you. Blah blah blah. I want to have right. that, that citizen heard. Because it sounds like they're not being heard, and if I can't speak out, then then I'm not representing them well. well so I would ask that we repeal that 21-02 and revisit any issue that's in that 21-02. That and, and I, you can do it as a separate motion or do it combined in this motion. Well, I, I thought we were gonna I thought we were gonna look at that because to be honest, um, Mr. Sanders, I. I don't know when the policy changed to where we weren't allowed to talk to the citizens, but the entire time I've been in office. It was in 2102. He just read well, it to you. So, and and I, that wasn't called out. Maybe it's pointed out or being enforced now, but well, that's not that's yeah, not anything that I ever, I, I don't know that I did. Um, Whatever. Uh, but I don't It's know. public record. It's, it's, it's a resolution. I've done checked it out. We, okay. Well, we, I, we agreed to the resolution. I didn't. I didn't, I'll be quite honest with you, I didn't read all the details and I'm not happy about it and I'd like to repeal it. Well, I, I don't know that I can repeal it right now, but sure I, I, thought, I thought we were going to, well, we are. I, I thought, thought we were going to work. Sure, you can repeal it. My comments. And, all you need is a okay, second okay. and we'll so, vote for and, it. And, so, and, and, and so just so you know, I do believe the council has the ability to, when a citizen comes here and talks to the council, they're not coming here to talk to you just, I mean, some people are. But some people want to come to the talk to the entire council, and it's a council's decision. And I believe that we have the right to address the citizens if we feel so inclined. And so obviously, so. you've seen the whole time I've been here, and we have talked. But sometimes, when when an individual is getting attacked up here, you want them to speak their three minutes, then address the situation as we go forward. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so, and, but so I mean, again, I'm going by a resolution that was passed last year. That it was five to zero, resolution that all the people. Is that the code of conduct deal? Yes. That, yes. That, so it's okay, all in so, there. So, so and to yes. be honest, you know, I I don't think mm -hmm. I did not in, interpret it to be that that, well, and, and we because we've yeah. had that code we've had this code of conduct for a long time, and it's never we've never had a policy where council is not allowed to address a citizen comment. We've well, never. It, you're it, allowed it, to. It just well, you should, and I let you. I even let you talk with them. And okay. I say, as the organizer of the meeting, it says right here, the mayor, yeah. you know, runs the, the uh, integrity of the meeting. I'd let Mr. Roth talk. You, you've seen it where sometimes you want to talk, sometimes you don't. That's on you. I, I, abs yeah, absolutely. Right, so, absolutely. But yeah. I don't like, because I, you know, I've let it go where it said, well, you can't address I, I That's just I didn't not. I say you can't. I said, normally we don't at this time. Okay. I never right. stopped anybody, and I let you talk the last time it happened. I, I haven't had anybody ask lately to talk at the at the other comments so you know it's about the decorum of the meeting it's a business meeting mm -hmm. it's about what we're doing at that time it's about procedure and one person on this council doesn't set procedure it's five mm -hmm. and the vote goes the way it goes and and i've always been about openness and that's one of the things again you've been here you and i've been here longer than anybody at this time obviously miss barnaby's back for with the break but but it's there, you know, I believe we engage the citizens. I believe I'm getting attacked for things that I'm not doing. And if any of you think differently, please talk to me as well as that, you know, because we are addressing things. Is there different ways to address them? Yes. But is there ways to work through well, it? And, uh, and yeah. Mr. Brown, I'm not, I'm not even speaking about the, mm. some of the obvious problems, mm -hmm. but you know, when a citizen comes in, and they want to address the council. I, I feel that it's almost disrespectful to not engage. This is my is my take on it. Ms. Barnaby? Mr. Mayor, I think that we really do need to have a workshop and you may have had that as part of your report and if I'm preempting you I apologize. But I think having a workshop uh, to discuss these issues are very important. And I think it's also going to be very important that we hear from our attorney as to when we have citizen comments and how we choose to engage with citizen comments because you can be opening the city up for liability. And there is absolutely nothing preventing a council person from getting one of the cards, seeing the information, 
contacting the citizen directly and say, you had three minutes at the meeting, you said there was something more you wanted to share, do you want to tell me what it is? You can do that. As a council person, you can contact any citizen directly. But I think that in the interest of having a, a well thought out policy that we're going to adhere to, it's going to be important that we have a workshop and I think it's going to be very important to hear from our attorney as to when we engage that can open the city up for liability. That's an important issue to consider because we answer to 58,000 residents, not just the one or two that come in front of us. Well, my comment to that is that uh, I'm not so sure we should individually <clears throat> talk to we had a, a, a lady come in here and accuse us of an ADA violation, and I'm not so sure I want to talk to her about that. Well, you don't I have think to. Can't, well, you said that's the way I could talk to her. I, I said it's a choice that you could you could well, choose to do it if you wanted if to. I did that, but that's 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 up to me, I guess. And, you know, I have to control my own behavior. But um, the, I, I don't know why we're discussing this. I have a, a motion. If it doesn't get a second. Let's move on. A motion to repeal the whole A motion ethics to repeal thing? 2102, and then the other motion was to, and, and you can hold that off if you want to just uh, revisit 2102. I, I was under the assumption we're going to do that. Yeah. Okay. We're going to do that? Yeah. That was we're going to repeal this? Well, I, no. We're going to talk about it at a workshop. No, to I'm asking, this, my motion is to repeal 21-02. I need a second, and then we can vote. Otherwise, we move on. Okay. If you don't want to do it, then then fine. There's the motion dies because of a lack of a second. Thank All you. right. Good. Mrs. Coachman. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> nothing really to report. Uh, just since the last meeting, you know, continue to get um, comments from citizens about the cleanliness of the city and illegal dumping and so forth. Um, and um, public safety and those, but those are things that I can get with the different department heads and we can put our heads together and uh, give it some thought. But Ward 5 is still alive. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Coker? Yes, um, okay, a couple things. First off, um, I just went to our quarterly Sarasota Bay Estuary program meeting. It was, it's a great meeting. Um, I. I apologize I don't have all my notes with me so I'm going from memory but um, we met out at Longboat Key and the water I mean looking at the, being there at the water seeing some of the um, I mean the clarity in the water so some of the things that are being done actually are um, are working um, that they have a big oyster bed project out there that I think made the water just so much nicer um, there, there is a lot of money that is getting put into this program. I believe it was over 900000 that's being put into it by the federal government that we don't even have to match. Um, the way the pro program works, we each put money into it, each of the different, we've got the city, the county, Longboat Key, Sarasota, um, and I think the I don't know if it's the beaches. I don't think I don't think Anna Maria is included in that. But anyhow, um, there's quite a bit of money that is going to go into the projects, and we have had some discussion. Myra and I sit on this board, and I really think it would behoove us to have someone from Public Works because I think it's really more geared towards um, some of the stormwater management projects and things like that. Um, I know it's been discussed. I don't know the proper way to have that done. Um, nothing against Myra whatsoever, but I think I always feel like I'm missing public works in the discussions there. Um, and, and I actually told them with, with them planning these projects, I'd really like them to get with our public works or with um, Mr. Perry because we've got some great plans for infrastructure and I think we could probably even make it better with what they have to offer. And they are also um, being used by a lot of the a lot of the, um, I don't know the right word, the, the proceeds that are coming out of these lawsuits, the, the, the monies are being put to the estuary board to put, now those are earmarked for the places where 
those funds were from. But um, it's just something to keep in mind that as a tool. And I'd really like to see us somehow bring public works on board. I, don't, I guess, Mr. Perry, you, we can work with you on that. But um, that there was a discussion. They did ask for a vote of confidence. Um, that's something that in the past they really haven't been doing every but like a five-year review um, I went ahead and voted in favor of it and they were put in favor for five years um, there was a lot of, there was also a discussion made about the funds and how much they were holding in reserves and it really made sense to go down to just a six months reserve because it is a federal program and if for some reason there's a disruption um, that money would go back to the federal government rather than stay here so we felt like the reserves could get us through a temporary problem like we had before um, to run the staff and salaries and all but um, we went down to a six-month reserve is where we're at um, there was discussion about um, uh, the additional funds that are coming from the federal government into that program um, are going to enable us to possibly speed up our uh, stormwater um, project over at GT Bray. That's the city and county government. So, um, you know, that's all good news. Um, the, the, there is a promising study at UF now about red tide. Um, so a lot of good things are going on over there. I wish I had a better, um, my, my notes with me so I could give you a better report, but I uh, just wanted to update you on that. Also wanted to, um, if, if you weren't over in Ward 1, you might not have realized we had this little event <laughs> over there, which I would just want to give a uh, you know, shout out to Public Works and law enforcement, everybody, because that was a big event, shutting down 59th Street, draining the, the, <laughs> the water tower. Um, it was quite a big event, and I want to just give them a shout out. They got it done. I think it was one or two days tops, one and a half days of the road being closed because that was a major a major problem one and a quarter it was a major problem for me anyway <laughs> but a lot of people i think so i just wanted to give a shout out to them um and uh that's all i have right now thank you miss barnaby thank you mr mayor um mr mcclellan can i ask you to come up for a second please because mm. <laughs> no no it's all good um uh, uh, Councilwoman Coker brought it up, the, the almost catastrophic event that occurred at 59th Street. Um, and as I understand it, it was because Comcast had a subcontractor doing directional drilling. It was not a failure of our water main. It was, it was not, not. It was not a break of the water main. It was um, a directional driller um, was in the process of installing fiber optic cables along the west side of 59th Street at the intersection of 29th Avenue, right across from Fire Station 3. Uh, they went underneath our water main and nicked the bottom of the pipe. Uh, the fact that they nicked the bottom of the pipe rather than drilled through it is the only thing that saved the entire intersection from being destroyed. So if you go out there right now, you'll see two small patches in the pavement one of which was uh, a result of us having to install a inserter valve in order to shut off the flow on the east side of 59th Street. Um, the existing valves uh, were not closing fully, and so we couldn't shut off the flow. Um, so the water was going out of the bottom of the pipe and kind of blew out, and as a result, it undermined the concrete pole that was uh, supporting the mast uh, the mass cable for the signals at 59th Street. So the signals ended up in the water. The pole ended up leaning on the power line. Uh, the PED signal was taken out. Um, and um, everything was put back in place and operational. Uh, we were, I was notified at 9.30 in the morning, the day that uh, the, the driller hit the pipe, and by Five o'clock the next day, the intersection was back open and everything was functional. So the only thing left to do the next day was some curb work that didn't require anything to be shut down. And if you would please, as I we had this conversation, are we sending a bill? <laughs> oh, you betcha. I can address that as well. <laughs> I've, I've 
contacted Mr. Parks and asked to speak with someone at uh, Comcast and not the person that delivers the newspaper to the C-suite. Um, <laughs> I got the construction services director's email yesterday. I think I'm going to have to go a little bit higher up uh, Seriously. the chain, so to speak. One of the issues as far as the question, are we, I, I, Tim Parks for risk management, I told him to put an all-inclusive bill together because I was out at that site six times basically in a 24-hour period. Start when I left the CCRA meeting mm -hmm. on the east side and, and I was out there that night. and. We must have had probably 20, 30 people from Public Works out there. The, 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 the on-call contractor that actually did the repair, that has the specialty expertise and the resources to do it, luckily was doing some work for Jim in a different part of the city, so he was able to mobilize quickly. There was two or three um, excavators that he had on site, loaders, lots of heavy equipment, lots of personnel and the like, and, and they did a miraculous job. But as Jim's pointed out, there was all these other indirect things that were occurring to make it the perfect storm, and you had pointed out as well, Counselor, and I think each of those is compensable, including the 250,000 gallons of water that are in that tank that drained 500, up. 500,000. 500,000, yeah, that are in the tank that was right across the street. Um, potential loss of businesses for all those appointments in the professional plazas that had to be, which are obviously private. But this isn't going to be, we'll just pay for our time. It's going to be an expensive claim, and I'll probably be speaking with Mr. Rudisell potentially to assert legal um, uh, claims against Comcast and their contractors for doing that. What really, really kind of irked me was after talking to Buzz, who runs that crew out there for the construction company that did the repairs, he had told me the night before, and Jim had told me, he goes, watch what happens, because when they went out there right immediately after, guess who wasn't there? The, the driller that, that, that pierced the pipe mm -hmm. and, and everything. And then um, talking to Buzz, he said, well, the drillers were here this morning. They sent some supervisors and some insurance agents over, and they were speaking about that the city misspotted the location of the underground utility, and that's why they, they uh, ruptured the pipe. And I said, really? And he said, I got really good pictures. <laughs> yeah. and, he, and after they scraped it, the spot lines were there. He showed me some of the pictures. The spots was, were, were, were spot on, literally, on where the underground utility was. They just let the bit get too far and get too wide and w did what it did. The depth of that was probably, at what, close to five? It was like uh, probably to the bottom of the pipe was five and a half feet. Yeah, five, five and a half feet and the like. So in the answer to the question, it, it's going to be a very expensive claim for Comcast's driller. They can argue amongst themselves whether it's the driller comcast the, the the permit company the spotting company whoever but i do intend to seek full recom you know, com uh, compensation for all direct and indirect t uh, compensable damages on the claim well and this is not the first time that we've had an issue with this company is it not well i'm not sure if it was the same yeah. drilling company or not i wouldn't i think i think what you have to understand is that there's a couple things going on. The first thing is we had a meeting with Mr. Rudisell who kind of educated us on the advent, uh, or I should say the recent developments in the Telecommunications Act, which really prohibits a city from getting into um, the, much detailed questioning regarding the permits that are issued, so to speak, um, the, the ability to charge for it and the like. And the, 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 the thinking, I'm assuming, is because the state, in their infinite wisdom, said, we need broadband. We need telecom. We need broadband around the state. We can't let local municipalities slow that down. And so we're very, we're very restrictive in, in what we can do in that regard. Um, that, that's a big problem. And so so you got that going on and then in addition you got all the other things with they just there's a separate contractor whether it's verizon or comcast or all the major telecommunications companies they don't have verizon on the side of their trucks it's the it's the drilling company mm -hmm. it's and then there's a separate company that actually pulls the permit so does the tail know what the the dog's doing? I, a lot of times, I don't think Comcast has a clue. They basically put together a budget, give it to a project manager, and say, go ahead, get it done. 
permit, do whatever you got to do. And I think they've made a conscious decision to just drill. And if you got to pay for it, if you pierce something, well, I guess we'll have to pay. That's what insurance is for. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, does that does yeah. that uh, uh, negate their uh, liability by doing the third party contractor? Because I know that's a typical mo with with uh, other areas that they contract the contract to the sub the sub, and then it it's like okay, it's his fault. And he says, fine, I'll file bankruptcy. Yeah, I mean, those are the kind of complex legal questions that Mr. Brutusel is probably better acquainted with Florida law to answer, but generally speaking, I'd say no. Who, who, did, the, who did the locates? We don't know. A separate, a separate company. Well, no, we, we, well, we, we, we locate our utility. Yeah, we, our, ours, but in, that, in that, that hole and in that area, who else? You had county? You had the county, you had uh, TECO, you had private irrigation lines, you had... DOT uh, might be in uh, there? You had, uh, I don't know no, if you had DOT, yeah. but you had Manatee County um, Electrical for the signalization. Yeah. It was telecommunication. It, lo it looked like spaghetti. I got a picture of it. it. Like what spaghetti. you see in the picture is six different pieces of conduit all having different utility in it. The other Plumbing, electrical, yeah. fiber, you name it. Yep. Yeah. And, and adding to the difficulty of it is... Um, the right-of-way use permit that issued for it is a Manatee County right-of-way use issue. So Manatee County is the one who controls 59th Street, so they're the one who issued it. So when I called my counterpart at Public Works to say, hey, in case somebody hadn't called you yet, you know, your mast arm, you know, your signals are down on the road. And so I think the exact words were, yeah, that's our road, right? I probably, we probably permitted that idiot, uh, you know, so. <laughs> Do we have the same issues with this new Verizon 5G that's going in? That, that uh, everywhere. Everywhere. And all they want us to do is, is just give them a permit. Give me a permit. Get out of my way. Get out of my way. Out of my way. And I made the point to Mr. Perry when we were standing there. I'm like, just remember, we've got somebody else who wants to put another line going from the Panhandle mm -hmm. down to Miami, and they want us to get out of the way. It's these people who are causing the, the problem. So. County's having the same issue as we are. Everybody. Sure. Everybody is. Yeah, There's a lot of underground fiber going <coughs> in. And, and when you see one of those big coils on the side of the road that are orange, about that wide, that's what that is. That's conduit for fiber. Well, we, we actually see had, them all over. We <laughs> yeah. actually had the argument with them because on Manatee Avenue last year, and I've seen it since, uh, they're pulling multiple cables at the same time. And they're pulling three different color conduits, right. including blue, green. And we're like, wait a minute. If, if, Blue and green, that's water and wastewater, it, and there's no law. There's no law that prevents them from putting in multiple colors like that. So if you dig it up, you have no idea that it's conduit versus water line or sewer. Ms. Barnaby? Yes, sir. Um, you know, we've, we've had a lot of discussions up here about uh, what what is working well with the city what isn't working well with the city what we need to do what we can do what should we do uh, but I think it's important that we send a message to our staff because we have individuals that have worked very very hard under some very difficult circumstances particularly when we had uh, everything was shut down and we had individuals that uh, worked from home while they could we had individuals that came in and worked to make sure that the city functioned under difficult circumstances. And I think that it's important that we say thank you, that we do recognize how difficult it can be to get things done these days. It seems to take longer than, than ever before, and we can't get the equipment we need to, or we can't, we can't hire enough people, and, and I am concerned about burning some of our individuals out that are, that truly care about the city and show up and work so hard for us so I just would like to give our staffs a shout out and say it, it we we are seeing it and that we appreciate what you all do uh, the other thing is um, had the opportunity to go to the Rotary Comedy Club uh, event at uh, the uh, Manatee Performing Arts Center and it was nice to be able to support the organization that continues to support us as far as what they've done with their uh, their donations to help us with our, our uh, Lewis Park and uh, if if you want to know the the quality of the people that that we had as as entertainers uh, the headliner was a gentleman named Jeff Allen and you can google him and find him 
uh, all over the internet, and he, he was he was very very funny. It, it you know laughter does a heart good, and and I think that uh, the cardiologist took a hit that night because there were a lot of people laughing, and their heart was doing good. Mm -hmm. Also um, wanted to announce that, and, and this is, I've, I've spoken with Mr. Roth about this because this is indeed in, in Mr. Roth's ward. Uh, however, I am an alumnus of Ballard Elementary School, and this year they are going to be celebrating their 100th anniversary of educating children in our community. And I am working with them to help them with their gala as well as we have a project we would like to donate 100 books to their school library so if you would like to make a donation let me know i have the list of books that the librarian has suggested i will also take um, cash donations to purchase books and put your name in them uh, if you want to to do that just let me know um, it's, it's hard to think that, and, and before somebody gets cute, no, I was not in the first graduating class. Um, wasn't in the second either. Uh, well, I thought that was a motion, never mind. Oh, <laughs> yes. So, we've had a lot of individuals I come. I second. <laughs> I'm Want sorry. It? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, Y'all, y'all, I'm, I'm going to look at you like my mama would in church. Y'all now, you need to behave. <laughs> yeah. um, we've had a lot of people that have come through Bowder Elementary that have uh, made a big difference in this community. And I think it should be celebrated. I know that there's um, one of the reasons that the Service Club of Manatee County even exists. It's one of the oldest women's service organizations uh, in Bradenton. They got started by making sandwiches and delivering sandwiches to children at Ballard during the Depression when kids didn't have money for food and their parents couldn't send them to school with a lunch. And when I think about all of the good that that Service Club has done, but they got started serving kids at Ballard. So I'm, as you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about this. I would love to have your all support. Um, speak with me. I've got the, the, the principal is, is Rudy Kieser. The assistant principal is Dr. Katie Fradley and Mary Olivia, um, or Oliva. I said her name wrong. I apologize. If you want to help, let me know. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. appreciate it. I'll do a challenge. Mr. What's your challenge? Wall. Challenge for uh, some books. Challenge the rest of my council to match me. Are you serious? I'm serious. Hundred dollars. I'm challenging all y'all. I won't embarrass you, but challenging all of you. She just handed me a hundred dollar bill. Mr. Roth. The um, <laughs> the mat. Uh, I went to buy the mat. The now other this day. is something I can second. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll be Okay. Um. Drove by, it went down 14th the other day, and the mat is uh, going to a whole nother level of, uh, of construction right now. Looks like they're getting ready to plant something in there for a March 18th birthday, so I think we'll make that. Um, I was going to ask, have, uh, planning, have, have we, uh, has there been any um, research or, or work towards the tree board? As far as I'm aware, I think we only have two members currently. Okay. So, we, so you, are, you are working towards it? Yeah, I mean, it? to the degree we can. I know Myra has been talking to people, trying to talk them into applying for the board. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if anybody knows of anybody okay. <laughs> that, that would be interested in being appointed to that board, um, we're, we're ready and, and willing and okay. ready to take it up. That was, that's all. All right. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And just going on that, playing off that a little bit. If you have any people, send them to me because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for people, and that's always been something, and they meet the criteria of going down it. So I think we need to revisit these boards mm -hmm. and uh, requirements to appoint. And because we got, I've uh, witnessed some things in the planning board that I didn't realize <coughs> was going on that uh, people not. Uh, attending I know we have tree board has been vacant for two years 
affordable housing board we can't get anybody so we're not these boards are not being they're not functional and I think that some of the problem is because it's uh, <clears throat> we were maybe too restrictive on some of the appointments and sometimes we uh, uh, don't require them to come present to us so they don't feel that they're important so I think we need to address that at some point future point in time as to how we appoint the the, the rules of, of uh, bylaws some of them are old the planning board is 2008 is 14 years old is like for the most part it looked pretty good quite frankly but I was surprised but <clears throat> there's some other things in there that that they're they're not doing and we need to address it in my personal opinion but that's you know I just had two motions declined so maybe my opinion doesn't matter thank you mr. Sanders and a lot of those boards I think are and Scott can correct me if I'm wrong some of the positioning and the people that have to be on them are dictated by certain policy or state statute and different things right the, I mean the affordable housing advisory committee that one is is done by statute uh, their are requirements for who can be on that board but a lot of them are set by either ordinance or, or resolution of the council. So we can, we can add that to our list of workshops. And like I said all along in all my time, let's have a workshop every day for eight hours. I'm open to that, <coughs> other than council meetings. So. All right, um, just going through. First, I'd like to, uh, I know several of us on the dais and as well as staff members attended a grand opening of Kefi, right down by off of uh, 6th and uh, Main Street there which was a great event and I've actually I made a challenge and I'll make it here that if everyone in this room told 10 people about it and they told 10 that it would make a downtown business successful um, and I have had lunch and I swung by this morning for a little breakfast sandwich that was unbelievable mm. so you know if you're, you're out there it was a great opening uh, you know obviously um, if you know the proprietor at it her family's been in the Greek business for a long time in this town of Demetrios, and now she's taking it over or she's starting her own so it was a great event great attendance and I think it's going to be something very fun for our downtown and one of the things that it does do is it starts a little farther out just from the immediate Main Street to start to stretch towards Village of the Arts so that's again where I think when we have our city county meeting some of those connectivity things are going to be important and I think we need our partners to work through that so that's part of it um, obviously you know we've got some great schools in the city um, Ballard celebrating its hundredth year um, is, is exciting to see and you don't see a lot of schools that have been around that long time that hasn't changed that much from the standpoint of their neighborhood and that's great to see obviously down the street we have Manatee High School that's in its 110th year so you know we've got a lot of history in our city that we need to keep building on and, and going through um, and then yes I did have on I had two things on my agenda uh, to bring up one of them was obviously going through our uh, community assignments for each board member council member you know we've got all of you listed out um, if you'd like to we will talk about it at the workshop or if you wanted to send you know the what you represent for the city um, and just looking through it if there's any others that we know of or you know where you are if you want to get off something somebody else wants to get on it just let me know and we can work that out I believe last year and from what I heard was one of the first times you ever asked where you wanted to sit in a long time and and you know so it's where you want to be so we can get the most effectiveness for the city and then also um, obviously resolution 2102 was right here in my hand going to talk about it that we need to to work through it and uh, talk through the workshops and go through it because like Mr. Rudisell said if we have resolution 22 dash whatever it'll supersede the one before it so um, I believe we need to work through it but we also need to have the respect of, of each other and the public meetings and go through things and then go through the policy of what we do um, obviously we're seeing some things come up in this meeting early in citizen comment that we have through the mayor's office we have answered every email that's come in you know whether it's public records email whether it's, it's different ways um, some some things you know through you saw two of us up here got accused of something today through the HUD housing that you know we all know that is not true but when lawsuits are threatened in that sometimes you have to watch what you say or do um, and and I have reached out to every person 
whether by email or by phone, you know, at times. And if, if they don't respond to you and if they don't get the answer that they want, then you're a bad person. And sometimes you have to, you know, look in the mirror too at yourself. And, you know, one of the things I've said all along is I do this because I want to be a better, um, make a better community and be a steward of our community. And we have done it, and there has been an investigation into some of the allegations, and the chief has sent emails out to those individuals. And if they want to go farther, the FDLE is out there. They're more than welcome to, to go the next step. And, you know, we believe that everything we've done is above board and, and will continue to do that. So, you know, is it frustrating at times? Yes. But we're here for the good of our citizens, and we're going to continue to do that. So thank you. Mr. Sanders? Mayor, uh, by the um, charter, the uh, council has to be informed of, of these uh, <coughs> incidences that happen with the community. And so could we have copy of the correspondence to those individuals making the complaints? Uh, and, and the other question is, maybe you don't want to answer it yet, uh, now, but you can answer it later. This threat of ADA compliance is, uh, uh, we're, we're, uh, Mr. Perry, do we, are we uh, out of compliance? I'd have to get the specifics. I was just informed of the complaint. I think it was a day or two ago. Um, you know, a ADA is a very broad federal law that deals with employing people, it deals with capital, it deals with programs and the like. And half the problem is that when allegations are made, they're kind of just thrown against the wall and not very specific. And so I, I really have to hone down on that a little bit Mr. and get with Mr. Maybe you and company. Okay. With, I'm not sure which, which Well, ADA. there's been a lot of threats with emails that, uh, that, uh, that's been going on for the last week or two. Of, of filing complaints and, and uh, suit with ADA because we're not in compliance with whatever the request was, and then it's been it was done more vocally today with a lot of pictures taken. So that's the reason I don't uh, uh, respond to it because I don't want to get us in worse shape by saying something I shouldn't say. Yeah. So that's why I was called out, which is fine. That's good. I may I may have saved us a million bucks, but. Uh, uh, again, is, 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 is their complaint valid? Well, l l let, me, let me just say this. I mean, it, there's, if, if we're talking about the emails that we all get, well, we heard uh, there were several ADA, you know, components that we look at ADA issues in um, our public services and things that we're doing on a regular basis. Um, I don't see anything in those emails that gave me any concern that we were violating the ADA. So I'll say that. Wasn't it addressing when we were doing construction? I thought that's what they were talking about. Well, we did look at that at the time when that issue was raised. Yes, that was. The, what, yeah. I didn't hear what you said. The part of the part of what was raised as a concern was something about at a meeting that there wasn't that there was construction going on and that there weren't like the normal public accesses weren't open or, or something along those lines. I remember that being brought up at one point. But that was, that was probably and I believe right, that probably that was two years ago. Yeah, I understand that, yeah. but I, I, I mean, and we're probably I assume we're AB, ADA compliant on this building entrance and egress. Uh, and what about uh, our our system of of uh, like Mr. Jones said that he has to have email. I mean, is he asking for? I mean, you know, if, if he has a, a, a if he's blind, uh, he has a right to have uh, a different uh, form which he can request. Is he accurate? Well, we'll start with Mr. Jones doesn't have a right to have the mayor respond to him generally. Um, Keep in mind that his complaints about having to get stuff in writing, A, were made here while he was standing before you, having, uh, you know, putting those comments and, and hearing your comments. Um, so, no, I, I, don't think that that, I don't think that that's a legitimate request. And it's been on the record before, and I think he said again today, 
that the reason he's asking for that is either because he doesn't trust what he's hearing, or I think he said today that he wants to be able to keep track, uh, it helps him catalog his comments. So no, I don't think it's a valid ADA uh, request. And also, all of his requests in those emails have been answered. They're, they've been answered by our, um, by Bill, you know, when he asked for public records, documentations have all been answered, as well as I have a minute and 23 second conversation, or a voicemail from Mr. Uh, Jones asking me to call him back, which I did. So we have all the documentation that we're keeping and um, obviously you know there's a lot of innuendos going out that, that just aren't. And that's, that's something that I think is a great thing to remember as we go through our code of conduct and do our policies of how you answer things and do it because that was one of the things that, that he complained about. Well, you let this one do it, but you don't do it. And you're not answering this and you're not answering that. So you got to think about what comes back legally. And that's why when we get that meeting, Mr. Rudisell and maybe have some, some uh, policies. If you look at, look at the school board policy, look at the county policy and go through and, and try to really, and again, this is a business meeting trying to get things done, but also answering the citizens because with the communication that we have, there is no time that a citizen doesn't get an email that doesn't get a response of some sort. It may not be directly from me, but it may be directly from the attorney. It may be directly from the chiefs. It may be directly because as soon as those emails come in, 724, if it's an emergency, it's answered right away. If it's something that we'll wait till Monday, and that's one of the things I believe that if we don't have to bother our staff on the weekend, because sometimes they're on vacation, sometimes they're in places that that, you know, unless it's an emergency, our staff should be left alone on the weekend. And that's important because I don't believe, you know, if a, it can help a citizen, then yes. But if it's just uh, questions that can wait till the Monday or after the holiday, please do it. All right, so we will work on that. Um, and yes, Mrs. Barnaby, the Rotary Club event was very funny, but I think it was probably the first joke that started it off and really went down the right road. So maybe. <laughs> Right, Chief? Okay, go, moving on to uh, department heads. I see the Chief standing up. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Council, I'll try to be brief. I've kind of held off on a couple of things for the past few weeks because the meetings have gone long, but I want to get just a few minutes. I promise I'll be less than five. Um, I'll need to follow up on that comment about by charter I'm required to something because whatever you said I'm not aware of so I'll need to get with you when it comes to processing of complaints um, we handle complaints all day every day um, you know they fall into different categories you know as last year we instituted a civilian advisory committee they routinely review our complaints in um, in light of Mr. Jones' repeated appearances here with his most recent complaint surrounding um, an allegation of misconduct by my assistant chief and one of my captains saying that, you know, they admitted to him they lied. I personally investigated that and sent him some correspondence on that on Friday. I decided to send that to you today. You just probably hit your email. And so please. That's what I was referring to. I didn't see any response. He, he accused officers of lying to him and he said he asked multiple times to have it in writing that and I don't blame him for the writing part but to address that and that's what's in the charter that any uh, possible indiscretions from officers are should be reported uh, to the council that's in the chart so I I let you all know about all complaints we receive <coughs> Um, can you can you get that information? Tell us where you yeah, found that cause, in the Because we'll need to well, figure out how can. that. I didn't know it was going to come up, but it, it, it does says that the the uh, the uh, the mayor is actually to do it with you in concert to tell us of any indiscretions or noncompliance of officers at at council. I mean, I, I can get it out. And yeah, at the appropriate show, time, show, and, show, and again, show, we'll yeah. research right. that. Yeah. We can figure out. And all that. Right. But, Something and that's like what, that. you know, with the report coming out, and again, I asked the chief, I've obviously repeated things that kept getting right. said. We've been working through that since that came up, 
and there's an appropriate time, I believe, to bring it up after he had it. Obviously, we know Mr. Jones doesn't always, you know, even when, when you find out the facts, if they don't meet his narrative, it's there, you know. Exactly. So that's, and, maybe, and that's, again, there was a court case that Mr. Jones said some things and lost the court case and, you know, went through it. So you, you win and lose some things, and when once the, the jury has spoken, you've got to move forward. And that's what we're trying to do without the, you know, negativeness to our city. So go ahead, Chief. Thank absolutely. You. And I think it, it was just a two-page um, summary, and so you'll find that attachment. I think maybe that'll walk you through a little bit of his ongoing complaint and make, make you understand that, help you understand that a little bit better. And as you know, anytime there's a very significant disciplinary matter with the police department, I've always brought that to your attention. Um, that doesn't necessarily rise to it, but because he appears here routinely, um, I thought it necessary. <coughs> As well, I had made a comment to you all a few weeks ago in light of Betty Lou Rhodes' appearance that her niece had um, had some adverse um, engagement with some of our officers. I told you that I would initiate an inquiry on that because I took that as an oral complaint. Um, we actually were able to get a hold of her and that was resolved without any complaint on her part as to um, the actions of the officers. And again, it's just logged as an inquiry. Um, these are all available for public record as soon as they're over. Much like I told the gentleman in the back, he started asking questions. I said, we will get to the bottom of everything and as soon as it's over, we'll release it and then be available for questions. So just to reassure you that we do look into these. Sometimes even I have to look into these things myself. Um, and Chief, on that note, um, we obviously, and it was mentioned earlier, that the body cams prove a lot of stuff. So when a citizen doesn't want to meet with you with a body cam, that's a red flag in my mind. It certainly can be. Um, they, they have, you know, been a little bit of a game changer when it comes to in investigating these incidents. And it's, it's all, oftentimes all about perspective. It doesn't mean anybody's right or wrong. It's just different perspectives And at the moment. Um, I wanted to mention as to the, the um, homeowners meetings, the community meetings, um, we have a list of those. I think you all have access, and if somebody from Gym Shop wants access to those list of meetings, we routinely get in there and change them if they're canceled or whatnot to get out and spread the word about the garbage and recycling, really about anything. Um, they're available. We'll give somebody access, and um, we always like company there. We usually start the meetings, and then we're were asked to leave so they can do their business. And then... It might be a good idea to invite, and I've asked you about this before, to invite uh, the council person for that board or that's, that it's in to to ask them to be present. They don't have to. I mean, it's, that's it's their prerogative to, but I would like to be involved in anything that's in my ward because I get a lot of these questions after the fact, and I, you know, I, I'll sit there and take, they can take the shots at me if they want. That's fine. I believe you all have access to that list. Yeah, um, but it's, we have access to a lot of stuff. It's hard to get sometimes. Where, where is that list? I, I didn't know about it. I know some of mine that have reached out to me. But. I will get uh, Mike T to, to send that, um, okay. the information on that, and you can get on there. You can see what, what we go by. We try to reach out and, and keep it active and make sure sometimes they cancel them for the summer. Well, sometimes they say we're happened. not invited because they've got other stuff. And so that will all be on there. And then it's at your discretion which ones you want to go to. We try to go. Um, we try to at least go for a few minutes to all of them to let them know what's going on. It's been, it was my guarantee um, when I showed up here a few years ago. Can't we just have an invite get, uh, sent to us? Uh, <laughs> well, it's a, it's I mean, the thing is, is it's, it's the HOA you. would have yeah. to invite you. Yeah, yeah that's right. Because I don't even know who's going on what night. Um, and so, you know, maybe if somebody from the city wants to do that. Uh, I think if you look at the list, you could read. I reached out to the president of Village Green, and she's thrilled, and she keeps me apprised of when their meetings are. We What we can promise is that we'll, we will keep it updated. Um, you know, I know... We, we look at it each week and say, is there any changes, is there any, so. Um, <clears throat> you know, I always try to uh, remind you all about what folks at VPD are doing and, and the good things they do and the hard job that they do. Sometimes people 
don't realize, you know, Brainton's a friendly city. Our, our crime isn't out of control that, you know, we're not doing the extraordinary out there. So I'm going to read this to you. It's just a short report. Um, this is, was authored at my request after looking at the body camera footage by Officer Sergnano. We swore her in just last year, probably stands about yay tall, um, newer officer, quite a, quite a young lady. I think she's about 23 years old. <clears throat> Says on 129.22 um, at 022 hours, I was traveling northbound on US 41 heading home from an off-duty detail. I observed debris in the southbound lanes of US 41 North, which appeared, of, which appeared to be a vehicle crash had occurred. I pulled over to ensure all parties were medically okay. As I approached the 4500 block of US 41 North in Palmetto, I observed a female lane in the middle of the roadway in the southbound lanes. I used my BPD marked vehicle to block off southbound traffic. I notified BPD dispatch of my location. They observed injuries of the two subjects found laying in the roadway. I rendered aid to the female. Um, who appeared to be in her 40s. I observed her left leg was amputated from the knee and was bleeding profusely. I applied my BPD tourniquet near her hip to stop the bleeding. The female had a weak pulse, which I began to take off the three layers of jacket she was wearing before performing chest compressions. After two compressions, the female gasped for air and became semi-alert. I then observed a male subject in his late 40s near the west curb laying on his right side. I went to check for signs of life with no pulse detective. I moved him on his back, at which time a weak pulse was found. His left leg was dislocated and had protruding fractures. I took off his belt from around his waist to make an ad hoc tourniquet to prevent him from bleeding out from his leg injuries. I observed the top lift of his skull was cracked and was bleeding, and I applied some pressure to stop further blood loss. The male then stopped breathing, began to make gurgling sounds, which he eventually stopped as I performed chest compressions to clear his airway. Um, BFD arrived on scene, took over medical care. I observed a loaded Glock magazine underneath the mail, but did not find the handgun MSO and FHP arrived on scene. On 2122, I was notified by Manatee paramedics that the male subject did not survive while being transported. However, the female subject did. This officer returned to work at 2 o'clock the next day. Um, in answer to your question, yes, yeah, she'll be receiving a life saving award. Uh, but I just couldn't think of a better way to remind you what, what these folks are out there doing day in and day out. Um, great training, great response, didn't hesitate, and um, pretty proud of her. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Any other department heads? Mr. Rudisell, anything further? Mr. Perry? Yes, sir. All right. The only thing I had forgot to mention in mine, and, and, and I checked with Mr. Rudisell, but um, the Board of Commissioners is having a retreat on February 26th for the Housing Authority. So, I mean, I'm assuming that all their board members will be there. I did ask Jeannie to notice this meeting if there's going to be more than one council person or, or I may attend for a while. Um, and again, it's their board is under public sunshine laws and rules. And, you know, I mean, it's not something that I think the city or any of us is trying to hide. It's important to, to get the information out. And I do believe, and we've said this before, and, you know, when appointments come up, I think our boards are working for that with the two appointments we've put on there in the last year because there seems to be a little bit more accountability at times. Um, and hopefully that can continue. And also, you know, that board is, is hopefully going to keep working in a positive light. So, um, I, yes. I want to make sure that that is a, that we don't violate uh, housing's uh, authority I don't know if that is a public meeting. It's a retreat with the board and the executive director, and I was invited only because I'm a representative of, the, of Bradenton. So I don't know that that is a public meeting, so I wouldn't want to step on their toes by doing that. I think we need to find that out first before we... Now, if more than one of us is going to go, yes, we we got to, you know, I'm an advocate for for doing that, So we would, but that's the only notice we need to get. <coughs> I'm not so sure that, you know, that they're going to want a crowd of people. I'm not sure this is a public, uh, and maybe it has to be. I don't know. But yeah, I, Look, I'm not their legal counsel, right. um, but I'm not aware of, of any exceptions. They, that board is certainly subject to the Sunshine Law. I would agree. All right. 
Hearing nothing further, we'll be adjourned. Thank you. All right, 45 minutes.